Appearing on the Ideas stage today, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Representative Joaquin Castro, Governor Josh Shapiro, and Chamamanda Ngozi Andichie. And now, please welcome the Atlantic's Candace Montgomery. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us at the Afternoon's Idea Stage. I'm Candace Montgomery, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Atlantic Live, and we are proud to bring the Atlantic journalism to life at our 15th annual festival. If you are with us this morning, we're happy to have you back. If you're here for the first time, welcome. We have a stellar lineup this afternoon to unpack some of the most consequential issues of our time, like immigration reform and border control, navigating political polarization, and the existential threats to free speech and expression. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our festival underwriters for supporting the Atlantic's journalism. Our presenting level underwriters, Leaps by Bayer, Pfizer, and Southern Company, our supporting underwriter, Allstate, and each of our contributing underwriters, AHIP, Barber, Boston Consulting Group, City of Hope, Eli Lilly and Company, Genentech, Goldman Sachs, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Visit Seattle. Now, please silence your cell phones, but keep them close by. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the idea stage, so please be sure to share a few words on social media using the hashtag TAF23. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Now enjoy the show. For a conversation with House Minority Leader, please welcome Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. And here to lead the conversation is the founder and president of Emerson Collective, Laureen Powell Jobs. Welcome, Leader Jeffries. What a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for making the time. Great to be here. Over to the stage. Um, last November, you were unanimously elected to serve as the House Democratic leader, and you're also serving your sixth term in Congress representing Brooklyn. And you have the footwear to show it. <laughs> And following your election as House leader, you said, and I quote, we will look for common ground with Republicans whenever and wherever possible, but oppose extremism on the other side of the aisle whenever necessary. And that's what you've done and that's what you're doing. In your career, you've led on diverse issues such as COVID recovery, fighting for social and economic justice, and standing up and protecting creators and artists. But this moment is unlike any other moment. The country is deeply divided. Congress is deeply divided. We're on the verge of a government shutdown again that will impact the daily lives of Americans and undermine faith and confidence in our country around the world. So Mr. Leader, is there a way out of this mess? <laughs> We're diving right in. <laughs> That's a great question, we are. Lorraine, I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I think the simple way out, and I say this to my Republican colleagues, um, three words, keep your word. That's all they have to do. There was an agreement that was reached. It was bipartisan in nature. It was negotiated by my Republican colleagues in May to avoid the manufactured, potentially catastrophic mm -hmm. default crisis. And as part of that agreement, Top line spending numbers were negotiated for this very reason, to avoid another potential crisis that um, the American people would be asked to unnecessarily shoulder. So those top line spending numbers were part of the resolution of the default crisis in a bill that was passed uh, by more than 300 members of the House of Representatives including 149 Republicans and the entire leadership team on the other side of the aisle, uh, more than 165 or so Democrats, bipartisan numbers in the Senate, signed into law by mm -hmm. President Joe Biden. 
And within a week, my Republican colleagues broke the agreement that they negotiated and demanded much deeper spending cuts than had been agreed to. Mm -hmm. And it's all part of an effort to do things like cut Social Security, uh, slash public school funding, criminalize abortion care, you know, things that relate to just trying to jam an extreme ideology down the throats of the American people, and we're gonna stand up to it. And that's what we're doing, mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. But there are also some who believe that your party should do whatever it takes and agree to whatever it takes in order to walk us back from the brink and that this moment is beyond politics. There are others who believe that this is a mess of the Republicans making and that the Republicans have a responsibility to solve it because they created it. What do you think? Is this the responsibility of the Democratic Party to fix this? Well, we do have a general responsibility, uh, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, to continue to try to find common ground with each other, with the other side of the aisle, whenever and wherever possible. Right. Uh, to get things done, to make a difference in the lives of everyday Americans, to build a healthy economy, you know, to stand up for freedom, to fight for democracy, to find the common ground to advance the ball for the American people. We were sent to Washington not to make an ideological point, but to make a difference in the lives of the American people. Mm -hmm. Often the best way to do that is to partner uh, together whenever and wherever possible. But as you also referenced, we have to stand up against the extremism whenever necessary. And this is an extreme situation. Uh, to shut down the government simply to try to extract policy concession mm -hmm. that the extremists know they cannot achieve through the normal legislative process. And so you want to threaten harm on the American people. Initially, it was through a potential default on our debt. Yeah. Now it's through shutting down the government, which is not a new thing for the other side of the aisle to do. They've done it repeatedly. But it's all part of an effort to basically say to the American people, either we're going to shut the government down and hurt you, or we want you to agree mm -hmm. to our extreme ransom note demands. And in this particular instance, um, I think we have a responsibility uh, to stand up for the American people. And there's a bipartisan bill working its way through the Senate, Senate. that was advanced by the senators two days ago with a vote of 77, I believe, to 19. That's an extraordinary thing mm -hmm. in the Senate or in the House at a moment of significant division in the country. It's a bipartisan bill that would continue to fund the government, fund disaster relief, fund the Ukrainian war effort, right. and it doesn't have any of these extreme you know, policy riders, so to speak, uh, that have nothing to do with funding the government in a way that makes life better for everyday Americans. And so the path forward, that's yeah. bipartisan, is to allow the Senate to do its work over the next day or so, send us this bipartisan bill, if, if. And that would be tomorrow? Possibly tomorrow, maybe on Saturday. Uh -huh. Senate takes a little time, y'all, to work out things. <laughs> uh, but they're working, and they're working yep. in a bipartisan way. And, and when it happens, maybe at some point this weekend, hopefully no later than Saturday, then I think House Republicans have a responsibility to put the bill on the floor for an up or down vote. And we will supply the majority of votes and we will avoid a government shutdown. So let's, let's just stay on that for a second. So if, if the speaker brings the CR forward for an up or down vote, uh, are there moderate Republicans that you think would join with the Democrats to vote up? It, it certainly would be my hope. The public representations have been uh, amongst some of the Republicans who are in you know, very tough districts that President Biden won in 2020, to mm -hmm. 18 Republicans who fall into that category, mm -hmm. including six in New York. Uh, and it would be my hope and my cautiously optimistic expectation that if the vote is put on the floor for an up or down vote by the members of the House, that there will just be a handful. We only need six, eight, 10 uh, House Republicans to join us 
to avoid you know, an extreme MAGA Republican government shutdown. Right, and most likely, Speaker McCarthy would be faced with a motion to vacate. How do you feel about that? Well, we haven't had a discussion about this issue on the House Democratic Caucus side, and our position has been, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. What is in front of us right now has got to be, I think, all of our attention focused on avoiding a catastrophic government shutdown, which is entirely unnecessary. Now, if, um, if eventually Matt Gates or one of the other more extreme members of the House Republican Conference decide to go down this road, then we'll have to have an internal family conversation uh, <laughs> and, and, and kind of try to figure it out. Uh, and, um, like but, an uncomfortable Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> but there, you know, and I've said this, I have said this um, publicly and I've said it directly to the speaker and others. There are trust issues. Mm -hmm. There are trust issues in this relationship because of the fact that the House Republicans demanded, I think y'all remember, basically demanded President Biden has to sit down with us to negotiate. This was on an extraneous issue. Spending has never been part of resolving the default issue because we have a constitutional responsibility to protect the full faith and credit of the United States of America, period, full stop. A default on our debt would have been catastrophic. They insisted that spending be part of the conversation. They insisted. So we have a Four Corners discussion, led, uh, of course, also by the executive. President Biden did a great job, negotiated a bipartisan agreement. It included spending. We weren't too happy about that inclusion. We believed it was extraneous. But we did what was necessary, led by President Biden, to avoid a catastrophic default. Mm -hmm. Negotiated top line spending numbers for both defense and non-defense discretionary to meet the needs of the American people. And then a week later, they turn around and break the agreement that they negotiated. And so, their trust issues. Their trust issues. <laughs> And mm. heading into the three weeks of session this month, the opening act is to launch what we view, and I believe the American people overwhelmingly conclude, is an illegitimate impeachment inquiry. Yeah. With zero facts and evidence support the notion that President Biden broke the law or committed an impeachable offense. This is what you do facing uh, mm -hmm. a potentially catastrophic government shutdown. We should be focused on continuing to make progress for the American people, solving problems for hardworking taxpayers, building a healthy economy, dealing with the cost of living issues, fighting for reproductive freedom, doing the things necessary to put people over politics. But you launch an illegitimate impeachment inquiry. We got trust issues. And so at the end of the day, um, we're focused on avoiding this catastrophic government shutdown, getting to work to reach a year-end spending agreement. And then if a motion to vacate is before us, you know, we're going to have to have that, I think as you indicated, that Thanksgiving dinner conversation. Mm. Um, one last question, well, a multi-part question. So let's assume that the speaker does not bring the CR onto the floor on Saturday um, and a shutdown ensues. How does it end? What does it mean for day-to-day -day Americans? Um, we had Speaker Merita Pelosi here earlier and she was kind of walking through uh, the number of people who will be affected directly, who would not be paid directly. Uh, but how does, it, how does it touch average Americans? It's such a great question. Um, and, and by the way, I refer to Nancy Pelosi either as Speaker Emerita or the greatest speaker of all time. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, 
Yeah, doesn't make one? my job any, and it's hard to follow Michael Jordan, y'all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we, we're doing but it as a team effort. just keep wearing the shoes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a government shutdown, and, and it is very serious, um, would adversely impact the economy, um, potentially trigger even um, more interest rate increases, which, you know, have already been something that the American people has had have had to absorb that's been tough uh, on folks, worsen economic conditions, mm -hmm. uh, limit the ability or all but eliminate the ability for most government agencies to provide for the health, the safety, the economic well-being of the American people. You know, clean water, clean uh, energy, uh, inspections, clean air, shut down. Uh, you're talking about the ability to inspect food that the American people eat, shut down. Uh, individuals who are at our border, our military, women and men, unpaid. Mm. Uh, air travel, complicated, which of course is also an important part of our economy, but limit the ability of everyday Americans to go visit their family or their friends or take care of you know, business, go back and forth to college, things of that nature. Uh, you know, a government shutdown will adversely impact everyday Americans in almost every facet of their lives. Mm. That is why uh, we have to do everything possible to avoid it. Yeah. And I think the final point that I'd make on this, unfortunately, is that government shutdowns have been in the DNA of my Republican colleagues for the better part of the last 30 years or so. Newt Gingrich and House Republicans shut the government down twice during Bill Clinton's presidency to try to extract a ransom note of dramatically cutting Medicaid. Uh -huh. This happened also, as you've pointed out, in 2013 under President Obama. Mm -hmm. Don Boehner didn't want to shut the government down, but the Tea Party, Ted Cruz and others, forced him to shut the government down for 14 days. Why? because they wanted President Obama, this was the ransom note, uh, to repeal the Affordable Care Act. His signature legislative accomplishment. Imagine that, y'all. This is what the demand was. 14 days, government shut down, pain inflicted on the American people. 2018, 2019, yeah. longest government shutdown in American history, yeah. 35 days. What was the ransom note then? That they wanted the American taxpayer to waste billions of dollars to fund Trump's medieval, ineffective border wall. Right. Now, they shut the government down in December of 2018 into 19. But when they shut the government down in late December of 18, Donald Trump was president. Republicans controlled the House and the Senate. In other words, they shut themselves down, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> this is how much it is yeah. in their DNA yeah. to try to extract extreme policy demands that they know they can't otherwise achieve through the normal legislative process. Mm -hmm. And all we're saying is, let's fight out on the policy playing field, you know, the contest of ideas, but it shouldn't be done by threatening the American people uh, with a reckless government shutdown. We've never paid their ransom notes in the past. I can guarantee you, we are not paying their extreme ransom note this time. Okay. Good. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I have a lot of questions. But um, thank you for being so generous with your responses. So the record of this administration is incredibly impressive. And significant legislation has passed, low unemployment, rebuilding of our relationships around the world. But somehow, the messages of the Biden administration are not breaking through. Now, you've made it a cornerstone of your leadership to have message discipline, and you're a very clear communicator. What advice would you give to the Biden administration as they go out and campaign on their record? Well, I, you know, I, I think any president has to juggle so many things. And, you know, our challenge, I think, traditionally as Democrats has been that we, we often are really focused on governing, getting important things done for the American people. Um, but when you're focused on governing, you, of course, by necessity, are focused on the fine print. Right. Uh, but 
while you govern in fine print, and I think as Democrats going all the way back to FDR, uh, through President Biden, we've done an incredible job. I mean, you know, Social Security, rural electrification, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, Higher Education Act, Elementary and Secondary School Act, you know, Affordable Care Act, and all of the Biden accomplishments from the American Rescue Plan, Infrastructure, Gun Safety, Chips and Science Act, Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. Every single one of these things brought to you by your friendly neighborhood Democratic Party. Yes. That's a pretty good track record of accomplishment. It's true. So why don't but, people know about it? So to your, to your, to your point, while, while, while you govern in fine print, you message, you persuade, you communicate in headlines. And I think we, we've been focused on governing, uh, but now we have to shift that focus. Mm -hmm. uh, continue to, to govern, find common ground uh, with the other side of the aisle when possible, but to lean into you know, the headline communication effort that is necessary so that the American people receive the accomplishments, understand that it's anchored you know, in a vision, really, to put people over politics, to build a healthy economy, to make life better for everyday Americans. And I believe that that shift is underway. Mm -hmm. And as we do it, I think the president uh, will be in a strong position to make his case for a second term. Great. Um, are you concerned, like many Democrats are, that a third party candidate in the race would only harm President Biden? Yeah, I think a third party candidate, while everybody has a right to run, uh, if it was a legitimate third party candidate that just wanted to be in the contest to articulate ideas uh, in the public domain and to battle it out uh, and ultimately let the American people decide, that's one thing. What I think is occurring uh, is that at least there are some forces that are trying to push third party candidacies mm -hmm. into the race as part of an effort to hurt President Biden uh, and potentially to help uh, the former president who seems like he's going to be uh, the Republican nominee. nominee who has, you know, who basically has a ceiling. Uh, and the only way uh, to win with that ceiling uh, potentially is for a third party candidate to take votes away from the Democratic nominee. That's why I think it's an unfortunate, illegitimate effort. And you know, let the two party candidates battle it out in the arena and may the best person win. But artificial efforts to change the electoral landscape are very unfortunate, particularly in this moment of great fragility. This is a consequential election yeah, it is. about democracy, about our future, about who we will continue to be uh, as an incredible, great, exceptional nation. Uh, and whatever the landscape is going to be, you know, we're going to fight as hard as we can uh, on behalf of President Biden, his reelection effort, because he does have an incredible track record. He does have a vision for the future. He's got the heart and soul and energy uh, to continue to do what's necessary to make America the best version of herself. Have you had any conversations with potential third party candidates uh, about this subject specifically? Uh, I have not. Oh. All right, one final question, because I know we're at time. Um, this, is a, this is a difficult time for our country. Can you share with us what gives you hope? Well, you know, I think what uh, gives me hope, and we've been through um, you know, very tough moments of um, backlash in the country, efforts to turn back the clock, you know, while we all are going to try to bring people together and move us forward. Backlash moments around Jim Crow and in the aftermath of the civil rights uh, movement and the Great Society, there was a big mm -hmm. backlash in America. Certainly, I think fair to say there was a backlash to the progress made connected to and in direct relation with the election of President, President Obama. Obama. Um, but what gives me hope is that every time America has found itself in a backlash moment, people of goodwill um, across the uh, political spectrum, but people of goodwill have risen to the occasion to mm -hmm. stand up for what is the best of America to push back against the ugly underbelly that's trying to turn back the clock and have emerged to make progress and to move the country forward. And I believe there are enough good people in America, certainly that's the case, uh, on all sides of the political spectrum, who recognize the fragility of the moment uh, and through the turbulence 
but you can't get from your point of departure to your point of destination without turbulence. Mm -hmm. Through the turbulence, uh, we're going to be able to land this plane and keep America on our long, necessary, and majestic march toward a more perfect union. From your mouth to God's ears. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Leader Jeffries. Thank you. Thank you. Here to discuss America's border crisis, please welcome Representative Joaquin Castro. And leading the conversation is Pulitzer Prize winning Atlantic staff writer, Caitlin Dickerson. everyone for being with us. Thank you so much, Congressman Castro. Thank you. Good to be with you all. 30 minutes should yeah. be enough time for us. To I wanted to hear Hakeem a little more, but yeah, yeah <laughs> glad to come out and talk. Save a little room for us. <laughs> so you and I have been talking about the border, about immigration for a number of years now. Some things have changed, some things not at all. I want to get into the full spectrum of our immigration system. As we all know, it's vast and it's complicated. But let's start with something really specific. So in August, 177,000 people crossed the border, including a record number of members of migrant families. And for a lot of Americans, those large numbers in and of themselves represent a problem, a deep concern. What do you think about that? Should those big numbers be of concern? And if you can just begin to speak to, yeah. of course, we'll have time, but begin to speak to what should be done about them? Yeah, well first, well, first of all, it's good to be with you and thank you for all of your work and writing on this issue. And thank you to The Atlantic for talking about it. Uh, of course it should be of concern. Uh, I think every country has uh, the right to obviously have its sovereignty, to have control of its borders, to make sure that we know who's coming into the country, that we're able to process people efficiently and in an orderly way, um, that we're not overwhelmed. So of course it's a concern. The question then is how do you handle that? And as you know, and you indicated, uh, our asylum system is broken. <coughs> our immigration system is broken. And really wherever you are on the political spectrum, right or left, I think most people agree with that. So to your question, what do you do about it? Well, you, the Congress needs to do what it hasn't done in the longest time. We came close in 2013, 2014 with co a comprehensive immigration reform bill. Uh, needs to step up and pass comprehensive immigration reform and also reform our asylum system. Uh, so that remains a challenge. It's been a challenge for the last 10 years since we came close. So how do we get there? I'm going to jump ahead in my questions then because you're speaking to the lack of action again on comprehensive immigration reform. We've done these interviews every couple of years. Any update? No, no update. Um, yeah. And why is that? And, and we all know about divisions between, of course, Republicans and Democrats, but talk about divisions within your own party, because I think this time period in particular, coming out of the Trump administration, a lot of the left anticipated with Democrats controlling both houses of Congress that we may see finally a new set of immigration laws yeah. ushered in. We didn't see comprehensive reform and we didn't even see reform on issues we just talked about that the vast majority of Americans agree upon on dreamers, to protect their legal status, nor on child separation, which at one point the full spectrum of congressional representatives were arguing should have been outlawed. None of that has happened. Well, I guess let me put a little bit of in a little of this in context. So I mentioned that we came close in 2013 and 2014 with flying colors in the US Senate, a bipartisan vote. And at that time, if you counted the Democrats and the number of Republicans who said that they supported some kind of comprehensive reform, it passed the 218 threshold that you would need to pass a comprehensive reform bill. So what happened at that point, and why we missed at that moment, was John Boehner, who was speaker at the time, refused to put that bill that passed the Senate on the floor for a vote, fearing, I think, that his base in the Republican conference would make a motion to vacate and that he would lose his chairmanship. So he didn't put it on the floor for a vote. And then the next year, he quit Congress and went home. Uh, and so that brings us now to uh, 2016, when Donald Trump comes down that escalator uh, in New York 
and makes immigration and the border the number one boogeyman issue in Republican politics in the country. And so that sets the party on a totally different trajectory. Uh, those of you that have been following politics since 2012, you remember after the 2012 election, the Republican Party had a fork in the road. They talked about doing an autopsy and perhaps becoming more inclusive, but instead it went completely the other way and became you know, harsher, uh, especially on the issue of immigration. So to answer your question, since 2016, 2017, as Donald Trump has defined the Republican Party and its parameters on this issue and many others, it's become harder, I think, for Republicans to compromise, even on things that Republicans had supported wholeheartedly before, like increasing visas. Mm -hmm. In fact, they just had to take their bill yesterday back to committee because in this appropriations bill, they were offering too many visas. And the far right, the group, the organized groups, got upset about that. So now they've got to go rewrite the bill uh, to change it, uh, to, to placate that right wing of the Republican Party. So that's the political context and climate that we're operating in. You asked about Democrats. It's interesting because you're right. You know, There's about 90-something percent of Democrats who agree on these issues of immigration, whether it's supporting DREAMers, passing a comprehensive immigration reform bill. So then you ask the question, well, what about the other 5%? What happens to the other 5% or so? Most of them are folks who are in swing districts. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are in folks who are in districts where immigration, at least for them in the Democratic base, is not their number one issue. Right? Maybe health care, maybe education, maybe jobs, something else. Uh, and so their posture is often a very pragmatic one, which is, look, this is among the thorniest issues in American politics. And if I'm going to have to stick my neck out to take a vote, I want to make sure that the bill we're voting on, that I'm expending a lot of cap political capital on, that it's not only going to pass the House, but it's going to pass the Senate, and the President is going to, is going to sign that bill. Mm -hmm. And those things have not lined up over the last few years. Uh, we passed the DREAM Act through the House. Uh, we passed um, uh, a visa bill through the House on agricultural workers last term. Uh, but if you keep the filibuster in the Senate, along with a lot of other legislation on different issues, you don't get to 60 votes. And so they make the calculation, many of them, that they're just not going to do it. It both makes perfect sense from a pragmatic perspective and is deeply troubling when you think about the human consequences of this delay, which seem to compound over the years. So do you think it's ever going to change? You know, what, what might change that calculation if not something like family separations, which again had the full spectrum of American politics up in arms, which caused lifelong damage for families? Will it change? Um, well, I think we have a few options. Uh, you can change the filibuster rule, and folks on other issues want to change the filibuster rule in the Senate. Uh, we can do what we do every, I don't know, maybe 20 years or so, which is win the presidency, 60 votes in the Senate, and have control of the House of Representatives, right? Uh, which increasingly in Washington is becoming the only way that you get uh, major pieces of legislation done. Although I got to give credit to President Biden because he was able to get uh, to usher through uh, the infrastructure bill, the Chips and Science Act, major piece of legislation in a bipartisan way. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's tough. I mean, it, it's tough to get folks who are in those swing districts to really go out on the line. And I'll tell you, I had with Senator Blumenthal, I had a bill that would have given a path to citizenship to the, the children and the parents that were separated at the border during uh, Donald Trump's administration. And, and once we took over the House, we had the Senate, we've got a Democratic president. I still had people, Democrats push back on me. Uh, they did not want to have to vote on that bill. They didn't want to take the risk. They didn't want to take a vote. I mean, to me, that was what the kids got separated from the parents. I mean, they were treated in an inhumane way. This was a barbaric thing for the Trump administration to do. And yet, for, you know, for whatever reason, aside from the practicality, that wasn't enough uh, to prompt them to say, yes, I'll sign my name on the bill, and I'm OK if you put that bill on the floor. To me, it was an easy one. But even then, it shows you a bit of the disconnect, even within the Democratic Party. For as long as I've covered immigration, which is now under three administrations, I think it's fair to say that Republicans have 
owned the conversation. They've dominated it. And if I could sum it up, it's this idea of pointing to large numbers of people crossing the border, images of chaos at the border. Sometimes they're taken out of context. Sometimes they're not. I mean, the border does get very overwhelmed. Now pointing to images of chaos in some American cities and, and making the argument that border crossers represent a threat to the American public, whether it be a threat to public safety, a threat to national sovereignty, or what have you. I don't think I have a clear idea of what the democratic message on immigration is. I mean, it's easy for me to describe the Republican side, and I don't think I know exactly what Democrats' proactive message on immigration is. Why is that? And what do you think it should be? What we tend to hear is a defensive response, right? It's almost the political version of what you hear on the playground. Nuh-uh, that's not true. <laughs> I think you probably need more than that as a party, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, look. <laughs> Well, they have an entire news channel dedicated. I mean, they, Fox News has got a border cam right now, right? So they have a they have, uh, whole apparatus of right-wing media that wants to paint every asylum seeker as a potential serial killer. That's what they're doing. They're painting everybody as a potential serial killer, uh, often these brown-skinned immigrants who they're demonizing, um, you know, using the slice of the worst of these folks and painting those people as the average person who is either immigrating or seeking asylum. So then, what is the counter to that? And by the way, that's a very visceral, very fear-mongering approach that instills fear and resentment in people and is incredibly, incredibly powerful and moving in American politics. This country would not exist without immigrants. There are four or five major American industries that would not exist or prosper the way they do, but for immigrant labor, both documented and undocumented. Uh, construction. I'd like you to drive around Texas in 102, 103 degree weather and see who's working out on the highways, on the roads, or on the roofs in Arizona where it's 110 degrees in the summer. In fact, go to almost any place where you've got uh, construction of any kind, and you'll see immigrants working those jobs. Agriculture would not exist but for immigrant labor. Uh, hospitality, same thing. So there's four or five major industries that would not exist the way they do but for this labor. And there is this misunderstanding that somehow these people make our country weaker. They, in fact, throughout history, the European immigration, immigration from Asia, from Africa, from all over the world, has made our country stronger. The United States of America became the strongest country on earth, not in spite of immigration, but because of immigration. And, you know, and it was, it was 35 years ago that a Republican president ushered in a sweep, with a Democratic Congress, a sweeping immigration reform bill. And since then, one that gave citizens access that's to right, one to that gave path people. Citizens, absolutely, uh, which they have derided now as amnesty, right? Um, but since then, our politics and the narrative on immigration has been dominated by fear and by resentment. Uh, and, and look, Caitlin, you're right. It's tough to get around those politics. No mm -hmm. question about it. There is no question about that. That creates a visceral reaction in people. Uh, and, it, and it's hard to talk people through that and out of it, uh, but it's important to work on it. It's important to try. You know, you and I were talking, and I said that's why, you know, I continue to do interviews uh, and, and talk to people, even when I know the people interviewing me, not yourself, but other like, you know, I'll, I'll do interviews where I know that that the package, the television package, and the report uh, is not going to paint a pretty picture mm. about the border, about immigration. But it's important, I think, to make the counter argument and, and to offer up why immigrants and asylum seekers are important in this country. So you've started to get to, to something I wanted to touch on today. I, I felt like taking a risk and asking you for your opinion on media coverage of immigration. You know, how are we doing? I've been able to go back and study our country's immigration system from its founding and study the way that it's been written about by journalists. 
and I've seen how journalism can influence public opinion. You're describing images that can be really, really powerful. Um, in particular, it can shift public opinion in ways that don't line up with fact when it's lacking in context, when it's, when it's um, painting a more extreme picture than, than what really exists, ex when it's exaggerating, yeah. or when it's perpetuating stereotypes. I mean, what would you like to change about the media coverage, specifically of immigration? Well, I think in media coverage, let's just take the last several years from the start of the Trump administration to today. Uh, I saw uh, the, the results of a study, and forgive me for not remembering exactly uh, which company or news outlet reported it, but it, it said something very interesting, which is the general focus of media is negativity, right? And so, the way that applies here is that when you've got a Republican president, the media, and this is part of the media's job, right, as a fourth estate, to be critical, uh, to, to challenge what an administration is doing, but the media is critical of that administration and those policies, so a lot of the narrative and focus then is, uh, is against whatever those policies are, a lot of the coverage. So with Donald Trump, if you notice, a lot of the media coverage was on the devastation and the inhumanity of family separation, of the Muslim ban, of, of these other issues uh, on immigration that um, were more consistent with democratic positions. And so now you get over to the Biden administration and you watch the news and it's all about the chaos at the border, uh, people overrunning the border, uh, just the number of people coming, very little of the humanizing that you saw during the years of the Trump administration. So you can see the media narrative switch back and forth. Uh, and in the meantime, the lives of these people often get lost in all that coverage. So I do think that there has got to be more, more consistency. I think that, you know, I have been told by different reporters that the mean package sells better or the fear package sells better, mm. right? This idea of chaos, this idea of hey, these people could be showing up in your neighborhood, they could be threatening your kids, you know, they're all peddling fentanyl, that that gets a lot more clicks and a lot more engagement than, hey, you know, look at um, you know, why these people are coming here or how badly they, they need a job or the drug gangs that they're fleeing in, you know, in El Salvador or so forth. Uh, so there is that differential there that makes a difference. Let's talk about Texas. <laughs> <laughs> And let's talk about- I love Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and your governor. I don't love the governor. I, don't love the <laughs> I figured you'd say that. So your governor's gotten really involved in immigration, right? Yep. Operation Lone Star using buoys and razor wire to discourage people from crossing the Rio Grande into Texas from Mexico, busing tens of thousands of people to democratic stronghold cities like New York to make a point about immigration. You've been among the most vocal critics, and I'm sure you want to get some of those thoughts in here today. I mean, talk about how you feel about how your governor is dealing with immigration, but let's not forget that I think the lack of congressional action, the lack of legislative change on immigration has created a bit of an opening yeah. for states oh, to take I this agree. issue into their own hands. We don't disagree on that. I agree with you completely. Um, no, I mean, Greg Abbott, Greg Abbott, like many Republican politicians, uh, metamorphosized over the years. Uh, this was a guy who was in Houston who was a fairly milquetoast judge, uh, who even when he got into politics as attorney general and then his early years as governor, was not this MAGA kind of uh, figure that he has now become, uh, competing with Ron DeSantis in Florida to see who can be more corrupt, more incompetent, and more cruel. Um, and he's not even running for president. Like, you're doing all that and you didn't even run for president, right? <laughs> well, then why are you doing it? I mean, um, but yeah, but they put, they, what he did was he, he took COVID money that the Congress passed. And here's an important thing. Um, we fight as Democrats, I say we fight, we argue with each other, we debate each other, when we have these huge appropriations bills, because the Democrats who are in quote unquote red states want to put guardrails around how their governors can use the money, okay? If you're in New York or California or somewhere else, Massachusetts, and you trust the governor 
in the governor's mansion, then you're not as worried. In fact, they come to you and they say, hey, listen, can you give us some flexibility on this money so that we can do some of these great programs and so forth? So there is this tension because when we don't get those guardrails, this is what happens. Greg Abbott gets those billions of dollars from the federal government that we supported over and over and basically plays a shell game and ends up with billions of dollars extra to do things like Operation Lone Star. So I go down to the border, we go down, he sees these people's private property, no condemnation process, no process at all, just move these people out, put wire on their property, and set up this razor wire uh, and these barrel traps that are essentially death traps, and they've got these saws around them. So we go over there and you see these people's clothing that is all over the razor wire, because people have gotten hung up on the razor wire, uh, and people have drowned now. Uh, and he's using federal money that the Congress appropriated for small businesses during COVID, for schools, for hospitals, et cetera. He's basically using that to fund Operation Lone Star, sending people uh, a lot of times, especially early on, unwittingly, was they were fooling them, duping them, that there were going to be jobs and shelter and so forth, you know, dumping them in, in Martha's Vineyard, uh, dumping them in Chicago, in New York. Um, and so that's what Operation Lone Star has been about. And also holding people on criminal trespassing charges. If you got arrested in Texas, you yourself got arrested in Texas for criminal trespass, uh, they would take you to jail for a few hours, process you, give you a court date, you'd come back for your court date, and the judge, even if you pled no contest, uh, they would give you probation and you'd pay a fine. Instead, they're keeping some of these people for months at a time, without, some of them without having, uh, having a lawyer, without talking to their family members, any of that, uh, until they'll essentially agree, agree to be deported immediately and not have their asylum claims processed. So Operation Lone Star has violated civil, legal, and, and human rights all at once. So that's what Greg Abbott is doing. And yet, a lot of analysis of Greg Abbott's handling of immigration, of the way that it's viewed, of the way that it's viewed certainly by Republicans, is that he's doing a great job, that he's winning the argument. Um, some of these policies are, are very popular. And so is part of your job to engage with whatever it is? I mean, we can flesh it out here, talk about it, but to engage with the individuals who think Greg Abbott is doing a great job on immigration to, rather than dismiss their concerns, engage with them directly, answer their questions. Um, you know, do you think that you're doing enough to engage with the many, many Americans who actually favor this approach to immigration enforcement? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think personally in San Antonio, I have certainly tried. You know, I can only speak to my, my, my issues and actions in my district and the people that I represent. Uh, we certainly have. Um, what does that it, look like? Well, I've just constant conversations with constituents and folks who reach out about the issue, not only myself, but my office as well. I mean, we get calls about immigration either every day or almost every day. Uh, so we're constantly talking to people about it and, and what, then discussing it. What do you say? It. I mean, I want, you know, if somebody says to you, I'm really concerned about the border, I'm terrified, I see these large numbers, I think. Greg Abbott makes a lot of sense. What do you say to that? Do you ever, are you ever able to change hearts or minds in those conversations? Yes, I mean, and I hope, and I hope so, right? Like, mm -hmm. at the end of a conversation, I don't always know whether somebody has gone away with a different belief or not. Uh, but I would say this, we have more Border Patrol agents on the U.S. border than we've ever had in American history. We have more drones than we've ever had in American history. We have more anti-tunneling technology than we've ever had in American history. We have more resources and money at the border than we've ever had in American history. Uh, and that's, fe that's federal money. That's not even including what the states have. Uh, and so when it comes to things like Operation Lone Star, there is a difference between border security and brutality. There's a difference between pe pe treating people like human beings and treating them like animals. Greg Abbott is treating these people like animals. Uh, and that's a road that the United States shouldn't go down. Let's go to New York, which has been on the receiving end, like I mentioned, of many migrants bust from Texas under this effort spearheaded by Greg Abbott. 
I know it's not your state, but I want to get your take. New York has been a real focus when it comes to national immigration issues recently. And what does it say, again, about the Democratic Party? Because you talked about you know, maybe 5% of Democrats who don't want to engage on immigration or don't want to do the same things that you might. But what's happening in New York turned into this three-way blame game between three prominent names in Democratic politics, our mayor, Eric Adams, the governor, Kathy Hochul, and President Biden, with each one sort of blaming the other. What does it say about the party that that's what happened in New York, rather than coming together and perhaps challenging Greg Abbott, rhetorically, legally, or otherwise? I mean, well, why I are they, Democrats you know, blaming each other? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think they did. I think each of them did challenge Greg Abbott. You're right that there seemed to be some back and forth among the three of them. Although I didn't, I confess I didn't follow, um, I didn't follow the politics of New York super closely. Uh, I disagree with Mayor Adams when he said that that these folks were going to ruin New York City. Uh, these are the type of folks that made New York City what it is, that made it the strongest city for the longest time in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, and remember, you know, the United States didn't cherry pick immigrants to come to this country, okay? <laughs> we, did, you know, we weren't in the in 1900s picking engineers and so forth to come to the country, right? Uh, the first major immigration bill didn't happen until about 1924. My grandmother came from Mexico in 1922, and on the documents that allowed her to come through Eagle Pass, Texas, where those barrel traps are, there was a line in the document that, that asked the question, purpose of visit. And in that line, her relatives who were bringing her over from Mexico wrote, to live, <laughs> that she was coming to live, okay? That's how, and she was coming from Mexico of all places. Uh, we and didn't so, have any enforcement of, of immigration in the Western Hemisphere at that yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, there was, no, I mean, you know, so, yeah, so I, I think that I, I disagree with the mayor on that. Uh, obviously, it's a challenge for him. I do think there's a few opportunities. Um, first, I was surprised yesterday because I had an amendment on the DHS, Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, that would have pro prohibited federal funding for Operation Lone Star. Operation Lone Star, of course, is what Greg Abbott has used to send people to New York, and all five Republicans from New York voted against my amendment. <laughs> so they're okay with Operation Lone Star and Greg Abbott using this money to then go uh, possibly send people to New York. So I was surprised about that. But interestingly, they, uh, New York has another opportunity, and you saw President Biden last week announce a TPS, a redesignation for Venezuelans. They have a chance to put into action, uh, put into action what as Democrats we have maintained all along, that these are folks who want to come here and work and be productive members of American society and provide them with work permits so that they can go do that. So it's weird that Greg Abbott has inadvertently created this opportunity for governors in New York and California and Illinois uh, with the cooperation of President Biden and the government, the federal government, to actually prove that these people, people can be helpful in the state workforces. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I hope that they will pursue that. I hope that they will do that. But also, Caitlin, as we talk about these issues, because I know we're running out of time, uh, I do think it's important as we talk about immigration to also think about this larger danger that looms over us, which is Republicans now are talking about an invasion of Mexico. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're seriously talking about military strikes against Mexico. And here's the setup uh, that China, and the Congress, as you all know, is very obsessed with China, that China is sending fentanyl to the Mexican cartels, who are then using migrants as mules to bring the fentanyl to the United States, which is causing the fentanyl crisis. Well, most of the fentanyl, 90% of it's brought into the country, is brought in by Americans, and it's not brought in by people crossing the border at those points, it's brought in at ports, port, ports of entry. But there's legislation that's been filed, four pieces of legislation in the House, that take us down that road of, of military action against Mexico, mm -hmm. which would be uh, incredibly disastrous, not only for Mexico, but for the United States, uh, and for the United States standing in the world. Uh, so we're at an extreme and, and almost unfathomable sure. place when it comes to this issue. You're right, we're running out of time. I have at least one question left for you. Let's make sure we get through it. 
Donald Trump could be reelected in 2024. Yeah. yeah. We You're all know that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What would that mean for the American immigration system? What do you envision? I mean, we'll just go with what he said so far. He said that he would have the largest deportation dragnet in American history. He said that he would restart family separation. So he's on the record about those things. No, but listen, if Donald Trump gets reelected, I think you're on the doorstep of fascism. I, I, think, I think that. Because all of the things, you think about it, for him, all of the things that, as Democrats, we have claimed that he stands for, and I believe the things that he actually stands for, uh, white supremacy, uh, all these horrible things at the border, um, you know, book bans, uh, stopping abortion, all these things, he essentially will believe that the country has now affirmed that that's exactly what, it, what they want. Um, and listen, if the American people vote for him, knowing all these things, knowing his history, and, and our fellow you know, American citizens give him that power again, uh, then he will be partly right mm -hmm. that they have affirmed those things. Uh, and we can no longer not take responsibility as citizenry for that. Uh, so it's incredibly dangerous and it's incredibly high stakes and, and I hope it never happens. Thirty seconds on the alternative scenario: If President Biden is reelected, what do you expect might come for our immigration system, and and why shouldn't progressive voters anticipate the same outcome that came during the two terms of the Obama administration, where the clock ran out and there were very few accomplishments to point to because the issue was not prioritized? Yeah, with another term, I think we I hope we move past the Trump fever. I hope Trump is done in American politics. I hope the Republican Party starts to move beyond it and it loosens up the ability then to actually compromise and come to some agreement on this legislation. Congressman, thank you so much for joining thank you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. for Big Vape, The Rise and Fall of Jewel, premiering on the pier stage tonight at 7 p.m. In the early 2000s, there was this sense tech could do no wrong. Move fast and break things. That's the tech ethos. It was wildly irresponsible. There are a billion people who still smoke globally. We saw this as the huge public health opportunity. The way that Apple markets their products was a huge inspiration for me. The beautiful objects to be worshipped. We joined the company because we wanted to take down big tobacco. Our entire mission is to put them out of business. And you just let them buy us? It felt like they were partnering with the devil. I don't think anyone could have anticipated how many children would want this product. People at Juul were sending out free products to a long list of influencers and celebrities. When you put something like the Juul campaign out into the world, it's like releasing a genie from a bottle. There is no going back. And nearly 15-year-old kids who are doing the vape equivalent of chain smoking. They blew up all the progress that was being made. James and Adam had lost control. Serious health problems linked to vaping. With serious lung damage. I was in so much pain that I seriously had to crouch. I was going through respiratory failure. We want to get on to the business of eliminating cigarettes and saving lives. You're nothing but a marketer of a poison, and your target has been young people. Here to discuss the war on Ukraine, please welcome Atlantic staff writers Anne Applebaum and Franklin Four. Here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic's editor-in-chief, Jeffrey Goldberg.
I thank you all for, for continuing to be here. I haven't seen you in a couple of hours. Um, uh, this is a great opportunity for all of us to hear from two outstanding experts who just happen to work at the Atlantic. Like all great experts, they work at the Atlantic. Um, by the way, have you seen these new pillows that we have? We're really, it's, it's, we upgrade this festival every year. Is it it's okay amazing. if I walk off with one? You can, you can walk off with it. Yeah. You can take that. Yeah. That'll be your bonus for the year. <laughs> um, it's the kind of guy I am. Um, so that's Frank Four. Uh, Frank Four is the author of, among other things, The Last Politician. This is the uh, definitive book on the Biden presidency so far. I guess you'll have to write a follow-up to make sure that you stay definitive. Um, but it's totally fascinating, and it's, um, what did somebody just describe it as, spicy? Surprisingly spicy, given spicy. that it's about Joe Biden, right? <laughs> um, you, you know how uh, hard that is? <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. That's a, that's a, you get the Pulitzer for spicy writing about non-spicy people. Um, <laughs> But it's fascinating. We're going to talk a lot about uh, uh, Biden-Ukraine uh, policy. And this, of course, is Ann Applebaum, one of the world's great experts on uh, this uh, former Soviet Union, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, her books on the Gulag uh, and uh, the Ukraine famine. Ann and I have uh, spent, uh, done a couple of trips to Ukraine in the last year and a half to see President Zelensky, among other people. Um, really one of the, the, the sort of go-to person for... Um, for everyone, uh, on, on talking about what's actually going on in Ukraine and, and what it means. Let me start with you, and then we'll go over to what the administration is doing. Um, but give us, if you can, in 43 seconds, <laughs> tell us everything that's going on in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, this, this year has been... And who will win. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, who will win. <laughs> and also, who will win the presidential election in America next year. Yep, I, You're now I, down to 38 okay, seconds. All right. Yep, but, I got that. But, but, but there's, a, there's a sense, based on some observable reality, that uh, the Ukrainian offensive hasn't achieved yet what it was meant to achieve. Um, I don't know if that's fair or unfair to judge it in the way it's being judged. But, but talk about, um, talk about the, the possibility that Ukraine would have a kind of breakthrough and get through these Russian lines and take back more of its territory. What's the possibility of that? So when you and I were there, which was in March, yeah? Last April? in April, yeah. Yeah, yeah. March, April. Um, people were very, very optimistic. I mean, um, now they're saying, well, we did never promise we would you know, break through the lines by the end of the summer, but actually they did think they would. Um, the Ukrainian uh, sort of theory of victory has always been about a kind of asymmetric warfare. Um, you have these big, huge Soviet tanks and you know, airplanes and boats, and we have itty bitty little sea drones and our little sea drones that are packed with the latest technology are gonna you know, break holes in your warships. And our little tiny air drones are going to you know, confuse and flummox your artillery. And, and that was meant to be, you know, it was going to be a different way of fighting. And I think on top of that, there was some hope that the new NATO equipment and new levels of training would help the Ukrainians um, break through what, what is a really formidable, I mean, it's hundreds of kilometers of tank uh, minefields, um, tank traps, um, you know. Um, so essentially, what the Ukrainians are having to cross is something I don't think any army has probably ever crossed, and the cl closest thing you come to it is something from maybe from World War One, you know. Um, uh -huh. And but they did think they could do it. They it has been slower than they expected. Um, I think they had hoped for more, um, but I don't think it's over. Um, you know, there, there. You know, I mean, literally as we speak, there is an enormous amount of fighting going on in southern Ukraine. Right. Um, and the other piece of the story that's very important is that there. You know, for the Ukrainians to win and actually for the war to be over, all that has to happen is that the Russians have to go home. So we don't have to conquer Moscow. We don't have to kill Putin. You know, there doesn't have to be a surrender in a train car, you know, whatever happened after World War I. You know, nothing like that has to happen. All that has to happen is the Russians have to say, this isn't worth it and we don't want to fight here anymore. So it's what the Soviet Union once said in Afghanistan, it's what, I don't know, the French said in Algeria in 1962, you know, we're done with this war, we're coming home. And so part of what they're doing also is, you know, how do we convince the Russians? So you've seen in the last few days even, they've been targeting Crimea, they hit the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet a few days ago. And so some of this is, 
it's almost a psychological game. We just, we want you to say enough. But, but, but the thing we know about Russia and Afghanistan might be the exception that proves the rule. The thing we know about Russia is that they have endless capacity to absorb pain, as we saw in World War II. Uh, I, I mean, Putin has lost God knows how many young men already. He doesn't care. And they have more people to throw at Ukraine, right? So, I mean, I mean it doesn't, no, seem, no, like, it doesn't no, seem like you can create that much pain. Nobody has endless capacity. I mean, so, you know, that's the first thing. I mean, even the Ukrainians don't have endless capacity. Um, and it's also not just about him running out of people. It's also at what point does he become really afraid he will lose Crimea and be very embarrassed? You know, at what point does Crimea become untenable? Uh -huh. um, you know, how do we... Uh, you know, what, what is the thing that has to happen? What's the, you know, they, you know, what's the defeat that has to be inflicted on them before they say, right, it's too embarrassing. Right. We're, we're, we're going to find some way out of this. But the, 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 the problem with all this is, and this is a, it's a question also for Frank, uh, it doesn't seem, maybe, maybe it's plausible, but it doesn't seem probable right now that that level of pain will be inflicted on Russia uh, before there becomes more, a higher, higher, and higher level of agitation for Ukraine to settle somehow. And so the, 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 you know, the, the question is, uh, the question is, are the Ukrainians right now in a mindset, the government in a mindset to say, you know what, um, Russia just might be occupying 20% or so of our country forever? So the problem with that, I mean, I, I, I even... It's a moral think, problem. But so it's not the, just a moral problem. So the problem with that, and, and this is, you know, I think there are Ukrainians who would say, do we need Crimea? I mean, you know, I mean, they wouldn't say it in public, but um, they, who, who would say that? But the difficulty is that the Ukrainian experience um, and the experience of others in the region is that you can do a deal with Russia. You can have a frozen conflict. You can sign a ceasefire. And, you know, and, and what does that mean? That means that the Russians will go away and they will um, build up their troops again. And three years later, they'll invade you again. Um, and so the, what the Ukrainians want is for the war to really end, you know, for the Russians. And it, it only really ends, in, it ends at a psychological moment. It ends when the Russians say, Ukraine is a separate country and it's not part of Russia and we, we're bored of trying to conquer it. And, you know, they could get to that moment. As I said, the Soviet mm -hmm. Union did get to that in Afghanistan. You know, the France got to it in Algeria. Right. What does Biden want? Well, uh, there have always been these people within the administration, including the subject of your incredible profile this month, Mark Milley, who argued that- and You get two pillows. Yeah, thank you. I was, I was, I want a pillow. I was playing for three, and I, and- uh, I gotta give was that, one was that too, gotta Was that too obvious? Was it too gotta, obvious? If you want to pull a surprise, I gotta yeah. give her a pillow. Okay. <laughs> Which, not the barber jacket in the basement? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Um, so he, he had this argument that, uh, it, it was a football metaphor, that the counteroffensive was the offensive line that was pushing through, and that diplomacy, was going to be the fullback that was going to shoot through the gap. And uh -huh. on the eve of the last counteroffensive, Tony Blinken was in, went to went to Kiev, met with Blinken, and started to really press him I mean, was, on. Uh, sorry, was Zelensky, Zelensky. Zelensky started to push him on coming up with plans for whatever the diplomatic right. solution would be to the war. And then, of course, that counteroffensive succeeded beyond belief, and, and there was a sense that another counteroffensive could gain back even more territory. But I think now it feels like we're moving to something that's a nutritional conflict, that the, we don't even know when this offensive, the counteroffensive will end. It could extend, uh, the Ukrainians say it could extend indefinitely. It doesn't matter that the rain will start in November, that they have infantry that can keep uh, punching forward and they're fighting tree line by tree line right now in, in Zaporizhia. And so that's a very different sort of conflict, and it requires different sorts of capabilities. You need to be able to continue to maintain all of this armor it, it, that we've, we've sent to them. Um, you need to be able to produce all of the artillery that is being exhausted, and we don't necessarily have the capability to do that. So it takes a different sort of war plan to pull that off, and I don't know if anybody has necessarily gravitated towards that position. So, so stay with this for a second, because I, I obviously, and I, we, we talked about this this morning with um, Tony Blinken, the, the, the Ukrainians are doing so well, obviously because the, Ukrainian, the Ukrainians themselves are, are fighting and dying, uh, and fighting heroically, and, yeah. and, and dying in, in significant numbers. Uh, but they're also still in the fight because the United States is providing them with the weapons with yeah. which to fight. Um, and the Europeans. And the Europeans. But it's, let's, 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 let's be honest about it. Without the, if the U.S. pulled the plug today, yeah. it's going to be very, very hard for Ukraine to maintain its position. So 
What I'm saying is that Joe Biden has a lot of influence over the way this goes. And if he, is there a chance that he will decide sometime in the next three, six, nine months that, you know what, the Ukrainians are not going to achieve their vision of a perfect ending to this yeah. war. So, you know what, I'm going to have to start moving them. I mean, you know, and Millie He's, floated. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the only, can I just say, the only problem with that is they need someone to negotiate with. In other words, you need the Russians to want to end the war. And right now, there isn't any indication that the Russians want to end the war. You right, know, the and Russian, so we could be in a situation well, like the, it. The, yeah. the Russian goal is the same as it always was, which is to conquer Ukraine. Right. And I think Biden agrees with that. But he, he uses a metaphor to explain, in a global sense, the Ukraine war, which is that there are three clocks that are simultaneously ticking down. Mm -hmm. One of them is the Russian clock. One will they get to the point that Anne just described, where they give up, right? Because, they, because to launch another offensive requires another mobilization, because whatever the reasons are that Russia ends up deciding that it's not worth it. Maybe it's just too embarrassing. You have the Ukrainian clock, which is that this war exacts an incredible cost on the Ukrainian people, on the economy, just the number of dead. It, 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 there's a, it, I think that there's some evidence that Ukrainians you know, the, the sort of unity that's uh, permeated the country through mm -hmm. the first part of the war could dissipate at a certain point. And then the third clock is the domestic clock, where in Europe and in the United States, support for the war is going to, you know, could run down at some point. It could be uh, what causes this government shut down and becomes the major flashpoint is that there. The, is that the same clock as the doomsday clock, which is that Donald Trump beats Joe Biden? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same. It is. I mean, but it could no, be. No, but, it could but be. no, you're yeah. talking about one, one, is, one is evolutionary and one would be revolutionary. Yeah. The evolutionary changes, the American people gradually grow tired of spending right. all this money or, or however it's framed right. and then want this thing to come to an end. The revolution would be when Joe Biden, uh, when, when Donald Trump pulls out of NATO. Yeah. And just, and, and switches sides. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and the only way to future proof yourself against that is to achieve a sort of definitive victory on the before battlefield that. before then, or to, to, against the odds, broker some sort of solution. Let me ask Anne that question. It's, uh, NATO, on the one hand, Zelensky on the other, how much are they thinking, uh, how often are they thinking about the American electoral clock right now? All the time. What do you hear? Um, uh, I mean, people are very delicate about it, as I'm sure, you know, Tony Blinken was this morning. He's delicate about everything. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, no, I mean, you know, I mean, some, some of it is, you know, if you, if, if you say this to, for example, a British person, they'll cover their ears and they don't talk about that, you know, don't upset You mean me. the idea of that the happening The idea of Trump here. coming back. Right. And, and specifically in this context, you know, that, yeah. you know, they're, they're less worried about our internal issues and bad things that would happen here. They're more, but they, everybody gets the danger to NATO and to, you know, it's because actually the role that the U.S. plays is not just that we give them weapons or we give them money. I think actually the Europeans give them more money. It's that the U.S. plays the galvanizing role. You know, we run the meetings. You know, we are the, we have the biggest, you know, the best intelligence. You know, it's sort of if you took the U.S. out of the equation. Right. Um, and that would be difficult for, in, in other, lots of areas as well, not just in Ukraine. Um, and it's very difficult for people to think about because they, um, because it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an unimaginable end to a set of assumptions they had about the U.S. all along. I mean, having said that, you know, the first Trump term um, was somewhat better than expected, partly because the current Secretary General of NATO, who's a very um, smooth Norwegian, um, Stoltenberg, who I wrote about in The Atlantic recently, um, was so good at managing Trump. And he was, you know, he was, he was polite to him. He welcomed him to NATO. Here's your home in Brussels, Mr. President, kind of thing. Um, but he also, he famously, um, he realized, okay, Trump is obsessed with numbers. You know, NATO's not paying enough money. So he, he was, he's a former economist. And so he created a lot of charts. And he would show, I'm, I'm not making this up. And he would show he, big charts. You know, here's the chart showing European military spending going up since you became president, Mr. Trump. And and it was, and it was, um, you know, and sort, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe there's some form of diplomacy that keeps Trump on side. I mean, the other, you know, the other weird factor that I don't know how to, you know, how to how to how to process is, 
you know, does Trump want to be a loser? He wants to end the war and see the crushing of Ukraine. I mean, is that going to look good for him? I don't, you know, I don't know. His mentality is so yeah. weird. You know, you I, may I mean, know. Maybe, yeah, he's done, like, in Syria, he's happy. There are other, all sorts of instances where he's willing to let somebody else lose if it's not him. I don't right. think that he especially cares about that. Right. I think one thing that you hear the Ukrainians say now about Biden is that they wish he was doing more to make the political case for uh, U.S. support for Domestic, the war. In, yeah. in, inside yeah. the United States. And that's States. always been a source of tension because Zelensky has this ability to speak over Biden's head to the Western public, to Congress, in a way that Biden doesn't especially care for because it, 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 it's somewhat embarrassing well, to him. To the him yeah, he's constantly being pressured. And of course, that's the nature of their relationship. It's symbiotic. It's that Biden needs Zelensky to push in order to be able to deliver the packages. Go, go into their relationship a little bit more. Yeah, it's a yeah. very complicated relationship because if you remember, Biden, when he first met Zelensky, Zelensky came to Washington in September of 2021. He was, a tra he was traumatized by everything that he'd experienced during the Trump years. Hunter Biden was actually kind of the er source of that embarrassment because that's what uh, they were pushing him to dig up dirt on. Oh, Burisma. Yeah, yeah. on Burisma. Yeah. And Biden looked at Zelensky and said, you're a comedian. I've been involved in Ukrainian politics much longer than you are because I had the Ukraine portfolio during the Obama administration. And Biden is able to relate to fellow politicians. And he looked at Zelensky as kind of an amateur. And Zelensky performed really badly in his first Oval Office meeting with, with Biden. And he had reasons to be upset with Biden because Biden had ended the sanctions on Nord Stream 2, and Biden hadn't been especially forceful when Russia had built up tro troops in April of 2021. But Zelensky came in and started pushing for NATO membership, and Biden told him, that's never going to happen. And then Zelensky started talking about how even the French and Germans didn't want to be in NATO, and for Biden just walked out of the meeting um, thinking the guy was an amateur. And then over the course of the next couple months, Biden is continually pushing him to take the intelligence about the impending invasion seriously. And there's no evidence in those meetings that Zelensky is responding with all the steps that we're advocating that he does. And so then the, during the first week of the war, they're expecting Zelensky is going to get assassinated or they'd been pushing him to develop continuity of government plans that they never saw. The State Department had become um, drawing up plans for a government in exile. But this relationship is always tense. The Ukrainians never share everything that we want them to share. They're suspicious. They, they worry about leaks. They, they come right, from, right. A, you know, right. How's their relationship right now? Is it better than it? It's better than it's it been. matures. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a matured relationship where there continues to be tension because they're simply not totally aligned in their interests or tactics. Right. Maybe you could explain one, one thing that's always a mystery to me. The, we go through this pattern. I don't know how many times we've done this pattern where, where the Ukrainians ask for a particular American weapon system. Mm -hmm. And then we say, no way, no way, it's never going to happen. Then the next week, there's an announcement that we're sending them that weapon system. Yeah. Why, what is, does that show like a kind of hesitation, enthusiasm, kind of bipolar loop or something? What is that? Yeah. What, what, is, the, what is the source of that? I think Biden, um, Biden, when Biden walks into a meeting about Ukraine, his question that he always asks is, if we give them this weapon system, will it lead to Russian escalation? I think over time, it's become clear that Russia isn't going to escalate in response to us giving them what they, what they ask for. Um, but I think Biden always has that hesitation going in. And then there's no art to, there's no science to knowing how Russia will respond to something. And then it becomes clear over time that all this talk about giving them F-16s or MiGs or whatever it is doesn't cause Russia to really overreact in any sort of way. And it becomes more comfortable for him to sign off on it. And also the pressure works. Zelensky's pressure on Biden tends to work. Members of Congress call Biden and they push to get yeah. the systems delivered. The Europeans start to push and his resistance melts. Right. And last word to you. This, and Frank refers to this, this anxiety, legitimate anxiety on the part of American administration and all of NATO, that at a certain point, Russia will feel so aggrieved or so put upon that it would do something that we would consider insane. Obviously, it's an mm. enormous nuclear power. Um, that governs so much of this 
dynamic. Uh, where do you come down on that question? So, do you think there's over worry about it? So I do now think there's over worry. So I mean, I, you have to be careful because it's there's 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 a you know there's there's not a non-zero chance. I mean, there is always some chance that the Russians would do something. I mean, you can't just there's always some chance we would invade Canada, and there's always some chance that. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know what I mean. There's a there's a higher a ch chance we're going to invade Mexico, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yes, yes, very likely, maybe even. Anyway, but it's, um, but, um, but there, but but so there's always a chance. When when people started to game it out, you know, what could the Russians do if they used a nuclear weapon? What would the reactions be? Where could they do it, and how could they do it? If you think, uh, for example, anywhere they used it on the battlefield. You know, wind blows to the east and radiation blows into Russia and a lot of Russian soldiers die. Right. Um, okay, they could explode one in the air. So there was, that was an idea that they might yeah, do that. So just to what, show. What's just to show. Um, you know, they could take out a Ukrainian city. Um, as soon as they do that, a lot of other things happen. You know, they lose their support. You know, the Chinese have been both publicly and privately very clear that they don't want nuclear weapons used. Um, we have been very clear publicly and privately that we don't want nuclear weapons used and that there will be a response. I don't know how, I've heard various versions of how that would look like, but um, I don't know how granular we were with the Russians, but there would be some, cat the word is catastrophic response. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a very, you know, it's a very high bar for something that would not necessarily win them the war. Right. Um, even if they destroy a Ukrainian city, then you know, the war's not over. You know, the Ukrainians have iodine pills and they keep them in their, you know, in their wallets. I mean, it's, so that's, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's, you know, there isn't a, it's hard to see how there's a logical way to do let it. Me, and, and I know we have, to, we have to go, but let me, let me, let me reframe that question. The, if the US were to do more, defined however you want to define it, you don't think that would push Russia to the red line? Not or now, that, no. Or that an actual Ukrainian punch through into, through the Russian lines would not provoke that kind of Russian response? We, the Ukrainians have punched through Russian lines several times already. You know, there have been, you know, there was the first, the victory in Kiev in, in the spring of 2022. Um, then there was, an, you know, a huge victory a year ago in Kharkiv and then later Kherson. Um, so they've done it, you know, the, there has been successful counteroffensives already, and none of them, right. you know, we hit the, we, you know, we hit large warship and a submarine that were sitting in the Sebastopol Harbor. That didn't create it. You know, we right. hit the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet, you know, that, you know, that doesn't do anything. The level of response that they can, you know, the revenge they can exact from Ukraine, they've already done. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've already used cruise missiles to hit, you know, Ukrainian right. hospitals. Right. So. Well, to be continued, um, this is uh, fascinating and enlightening. Thank you to both of you. I'll steal the pillows tomorrow. We'll leave them here for now. Um, but I want to thank you both for, I want to thank you both for coming. And thank you all. And see you soon. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what? Oh, that way? And now here's a trailer for Bad Press showing on the Piers stage tomorrow at 3.15 p.m. Before Oklahoma was ever even a state, there was a Native American citizen running a daily newspaper. But here I am reporting on news topics that maybe don't show my tribe in the best light. Our tribal government Roll call, vote, please. wasn't prepared for hungry journalists. All right, Jared, what you got? Snooping around and doing the news. Three top officials were arrested. The word embezzlement comes to mind. But it's all the Muscogee Creek people have as far as a source of news, and someone's got to do it. Good morning, everyone. Tonight, there will be a bill to repeal the historic free press bill in its entirety. It's a D day and like the has hit the fan. Now, these elected officials have a direct line to put out polished turds every day. Man, the paper's dead, dude. You yeah. gotta leak it to somebody. Because we published the story, because we aired it, are they going to arrest us? I have had my stories edited by the executive branch, and that's not fair, it's not transparent. The 
ultimate fate of freedom of press is directly hinged on the outcome of this election. This is a giant nebulous of crazy going on. Now, actually, I knew Jimmy Buffett back in the 80s, and I won't get into that. Chips fall where they may, and let's hope that they're free press chips, man. Hard to find a spot. Here to discuss a new era for Pennsylvania, welcome Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. Here to lead the conversation is John Dickerson, anchor of CBS News Primetime with John Dickerson and chief political analyst at CBS News. These are <coughs> they're very cushy, seats. yes. Yeah. All right. Does does this count as a red carpet interview or <laughs> I don't know. It's like it's like the red living I'm a room. little colorblind, but this is yeah. very bright. Yes, exactly. It's very calming, though. I feel it's. Uh, um, yeah. Are we crossing our legs? Is that. I don't I, really governor, know <laughs> what to do here. I was not expecting a start like this. All right. <laughs> Heavy. I feel like we're doing great, though. Yeah. So we're, we're These are the kinds spread. of leadership decisions we Thank want you. to hear yes. from you about. Yes. yes. I'll try and yes. figure it out right. during the. First leg crossing, then your opinions on flossing. There um, you go. All right. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, the 48th governor of uh, yeah. Pennsylvania. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, Governor, as we settle ourselves into these voluminous <laughs> chairs, um, let's start with um, this is the week for presidents and presidential candidates to visit the union workers in Detroit. The yeah. President Biden was there, former President Trump paid a visit. You've got a strong union presence in your state, yep. and you, you tweeted six days ago, I stand with the striking UAW workers, and I made clear these workers and their families deserve to share in the record, record profits these companies are making. The gap between what executives are making compared to what workers are earning is growing. We need to reverse that. Let me focus on the last part. We need to reverse sure. that. Do you mean with respect to the auto companies or more broadly? Because obviously the gap between CEO pay and regular pay has widened a great yeah. deal. I, I was trying to make two points there. Number one, I stand with those UAW workers. I think that they do deserve to reap more benefits from the hard work that they perform. And while all the focus has been on Michigan, we've got folks in Pennsylvania who are members of UAW who do that important work. The second point I was trying to make is a broader one, and that is that um, when you look back in the history of the union movement, look back in the history of this nation, at the times where we have the closest gap between the workers and the executives, that's when union membership is at its highest. As union membership goes down, that gap grows. I don't think that that's accidental. My view is that we need to make sure that we protect union rights, and as governor, I want to expand union rights in Pennsylvania. I want to make sure that that gap between the worker and the guy or the woman who gets to sit in the executive suite uh, is made closer. I think that that. How do you that, do that? I think that division right now is one of the things that's actually leading to more division in our politics. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll talk about some politics today. How do we do that? We make sure we protect the union way of life. We make sure that we expand opportunities to join a union. We make sure that that wage gap is narrowed as much as we can. And when we have executives, I'm the chief executive of my commonwealth, we invest in our workforce. We not only invest in their wages and benefits, we break down barriers to entry and give more people opportunity. I think that's what we're focused on in the commonwealth. Quick symbolic question. I stand with the striking UAW workers. Are you, any chance you might make that anything more than metaphorical? I mean, Physically go to Michigan. I mean, or, or, or where they're, they're striking in your state. They, they are striking in the southeastern part of our state. I, look, Bucks I've, County, I've I believe, is a swing district. Picket lines. I've stood with striking workers. There may be an opportunity for me to physically do that here, but I thought it was really important to make clear where I stood in this issue. You touched on it a little bit, but now let's broaden this out outside of the unions. I mean, the pressures and forces that union workers are facing and that the car companies are facing as they try to transition from. 
uh, from uh, gasoline-powered cars to electric vehicles are a part of some of the pressures of our, in our economy. You have worked to try to change the access to the American dream in your state more broadly. Um, talk a little bit about that and whether you think, because the old way route to the American dream was you sign up with the company, there's a social contract with the employer, you have a kind of the workers would, would help the company, the company would help the workers. That's at least the theory of it in the American system. Right. Um, what's the state of that contract right now and what needs to be fixed for it to work in your state? I think the contract in many ways has been broken or it's threatened. I think too often times we set these arbitrary requirements, arbitrary barriers to entry. I believe in Pennsylvania and I would argue would be healthy for this nation that um, we should have the freedom to chart our own course and the opportunity to succeed. One of the best ways you do that is you lay a foundation for folks that's fair and equitable, and then give them the opportunities to be able to move forward through that. Let me give you a, a concrete example of that. On day one of my administration, I signed an executive order doing away with the college degree requirement for 92% of state government jobs. That's 66,000 jobs. Now, why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important, because to set an artificial barrier to entry for someone who has the skills, who has the knowledge, the determination, but says, you can't do that job unless you've got a college degree, that's not fair. And by the way, it also doesn't make sense. <laughs> at, at a moment where every city, every state, every part of our nation, it seems, is struggling with workforce issues, mm -hmm. why the hell would we make it harder for people who, in my case, want to serve in public service, who have the skills and can't do it. I'll tell you when this got crystallized for me. Um, I ran an entire campaign for governor about real freedom. And real freedom means having access to that market, having access to that job, not having people erect those, those barriers uh, to entry. I was at a firehouse in a rural community in Pennsylvania. I just wrapped up my remarks, was signing stuff, talking to people. And someone came over to me and, and said, I'm really looking forward to you being my boss. I said, well, what do you mean? He goes. Well, I work for the Department of Environmental Protection. I said, well, I'm gonna be your colleague, not your boss, but go on, explain. And, and he said, I, I work in such and such a division, and I train for the last nearly two decades, I train all the folks with this particular skill who go out and do this research, this investigation uh, in our communities. And I said, well, are you like the manager or whatever? What's your title, your deputy secretary or something? He goes, no. He goes, I've actually, um, I train all the people that go on to be deputy secretary but I'm still at this level. And the reason is I don't have a college degree. Think about that. This is the guy who's actually training everybody to do the work, but because of an arbitrary degree requirement, we shut him out of a future of opportunity. Let me offer you one other proof point, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, we're struggling in Pennsylvania, and I think this is true across the country when you look at the data, to be able to recruit and train highly skilled, highly qualified, diverse set of police officers. Now, I'm someone who believes we need more police in this country, not less. I'm someone who believes people have a right to both be safe and feel safe. I understand there may be some in this room or some watching who disagree with that, but that's my view. Now, I believe if you look at the way we are recruiting, we're not doing a good enough job making sure police officers look like the communities they're sworn to serve and protect. So we dropped the college degree requirement for our state police in Pennsylvania one month ago yesterday. Now, in the last year, we had 1,800 applicants to be state troopers in Pennsylvania. In the last month, we had 1,200 applicants after we dropped that college degree requirement. Now, are we gonna hire all of them? No, and are they gonna go through rigorous training in the selection process? Absolutely, but we got over 500 of those individuals who would have been shut out of the process before. There are people who want to serve. Probably have military background, probably have other important backgrounds who are going to help us keep our communities safe. This is common sense to remove those barriers to entry and help our communities be safer and stronger. So we're going to click through a couple of different things, but I want to know if you have one more thing. Because what we're talking <clears throat> about here actually, you know, is access, that freedom you're talking about to yeah. you know, the American way of life. So That's what else uh, quickly would you think we say we should focus on or that you're focused on in terms of creating greater opportunity for people? Look, I think you have to invest in public schools in this country. I'm certainly doing that in our commonwealth. Um, we, we passed a budget that invests more in public education than at any time in the history of Pennsylvania. And it's important to note, I'm the only governor in the nation with a full-time divided legislature. 
So to get that through Republicans and Democrats was not easy. But I'll also say, to answer your question directly, John, it's not just about writing a check to our schools. It's what do you do with those funds? So to create more opportunity, we put more funding into VOTEC. Now they call it CTE nowadays, but we put more money into that. And expanding that definition out to include farming and include computer science. We need more welders and plumbers in this country. We should start training them in high school, giving them that opportunity. Okay. All right, let's move on to the business of governing. Uh, this is this is enough. This is almost as much of a softball as these are made yeah. soft material. I'm still not I sure. Yeah. I-95. Yeah. All right. Have I ever With, been on 95? Um, what did you learn from that experience about the capacity to move quickly, and how much of what you learned about the capacity to get things done quickly was really because it was an emergency and can't be ported into the rest of the job you do. Yeah, that's fair. Let me, let me take a quick half step back to set the table. Um, I-95 through Northeast Philadelphia, 175,000 cars and trucks every single day, one of the busiest roadways in our nation, obviously goes from Maine to Florida. That's a key choke point. And I got a call at seven o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning from my chief of staff. Um, tanker truck caught fire underneath a 200 plus foot you know, bridge or overpass. Uh, it was so hot that it caused 95 to literally collapse. The experts told us it would take months to repair. Now, we got 95 reopened in 12 days. And I want to tell you how we did that. We did it. We did it on the strength, back to your first question, of organized labor. Union labor rebuilt I-95, and I'm proud of them for doing that. We did it on the strength of innovative thinking, creative thinking, quick thinking. To answer your question directly, the one thing I was able to do because it was an emergency situation is I was able to sign a declaration which allowed us to get through the procurement process, mm -hmm. you know, lickety split. I if think you that's hadn't, the legal how long term. would that have taken? Couple that could years. have taken weeks or months. But after that, I see you smirking. Hold no, on, no, let me I, finish. it's not a smirk. <laughs> it's not a smirk. After Deep that, interest in what you're saying. Everything we did could be applied to any road project, bridge project, pipe project, whatever, today. Here's what we did. We empowered people on the ground to be leaders. They didn't have to stop their work and call headquarters and wait for a bureaucrat to answer their question. So number one, we encourage people to be leaders on the scene. We also encourage them to think innovatively about a solution. So I was over top of 95 a few hours after the collapse in a helicopter looking down and I said something effective, why don't we just like fill that whole hole with dirt and pave over it? And you know, they all looked at me and wanted to be like, this guy's a real idiot, but they couldn't say that because mm -hmm. he's the governor. So, but they were thinking it, they yeah. didn't say it directly in my face, but through a whole series of conversations through that night and early next morning, leaders on the ground said, you know what? Instead of filling it with dirt, we're gonna use a recycled aggregate that's lighter than dirt, doesn't take any time to settle, you can pave right over it, and we think that that will make the process go more quickly. The reason folks felt comfortable to kind of raise their hand and speak up about that is we were encouraging them to be leaders, encouraging them to be innovative, and because they were willing to do that, because organized labor was quite literally being willing to work 24 seven, when the eyes of the nation were on us, they saw that we could get this done quick and they saw that we could do big things. And, and I would hope that every American took some pride in that because it showed what American labor and American ingenuity can still accomplish. We, we talk ourselves down too much in this nation and, and we need to talk ourselves up because we can do big things again. Here's why. I Here's, here's why I'm interested in this and why I gave you all that pristine runway. Um, <laughs> I was talking to a, an administration official who said much of their job at the beginning was just laying pipe, which is to say, getting the capacity there to even execute any of their grand ideas. Yeah. And that when you come in and when you're a governor, when you come in in any executive position, there's a lot of stuff, procurement policy, there's yeah. all this stuff you gotta learn about, and then it's like three years into the job and you haven't been able to do anything. So the capacity to act quickly, to move from idea to execution is a challenge for any executive, for any administrator, for any president. So what I'm wondering is whether 
this instance, so that was one, how do you, in practice, say to somebody, I'm empowering you? Like, how does that, in a practical way, happen? And can you replicate it in a non-emergency environment? Uh, you can, and, and we have, in multiple ways in my administration. Um, it starts, in my administration, with three letters, uh, GSD. And since this is a family show, I'll just say it means get stuff done. <laughs> and that is how we live every single day in our administration. It is, I'm a sports guy, it's our job to put points on the board every single day for my constituents, for the people of Pennsylvania. Um, they don't want me to go to work and just talk. They want me to go to work and act. So 95 is a great example of that. Here's another example. Um, you want to get something done in Pennsylvania? You need a permit or you need a license. It's probably true in every other city and every state. The typical permit we give out in Pennsylvania is a like a corporate filing, a business license. Well, the day I got sworn in, it took eight weeks to get that. When you start to look under the hood and you ask the bureaucracy, well, why is it taking eight weeks? What do you need to process this and that? And you push the bureaucracy and you show an interest as the manager, as the leader, as the executive in the outcomes and how long it's going to take and you bring that aggressive attitude to everything, you can really make change. Case in point, that corporate filing that took eight weeks the day I got sworn in now takes three days in Pennsylvania, just three days. And we have example after example like that where we've been able to speed up the bureaucracy, get stuff done, and put points on the board for folks. We need to show people that we can deliver for them. And, and by the way, there's a, there's a byproduct of this that I think makes our democracy and our government and public service, the idea of it, stronger. And that is that you know folks are down and frustrated right now. They kind of think government can't do big things. I think that's one of the reasons why they were so excited about 95 and what we were collectively able to do there, federal, state, and local government working together. They want to see their government work. And if we can show them government works, whether on a permit or a road, then we can hopefully restore people's faith in our democracy and in our democratic institutions, which is something I take very seriously. I think I have a responsibility, along with others, to try and improve um, the way people feel about government and make sure everyone knows that government can be a positive, productive force for good in people's lives. And we're going to get to that uh, democracy protection um, because to the extent people are frustrated with the way government does or doesn't work, they, they go around it and find their own methods um, to affecting the change they want, which can sometimes be violent. But let's leave that aside for just a moment. Infrastructure is a key challenge and a, and a key thing for economic growth in yep. any state. What's uh, the most important infrastructure improvement for you in your sprawling state, I mean, hmm. is it roads, is it, is it uh, the airports, is it trains? What's the most important thing or the most effective thing you could do to yeah. increase economic growth in your state? It's hard to pick one, I will, because you asked, but I, I would just say, generally speaking, if you look at the trajectory of our nation throughout history, the positive economic growth, positive job growth, the, the positive outcomes we've seen in communities have oftentimes correlated with significant investments in infrastructure. You invest in infrastructure, you tend to have positive things happen, particularly the way the Biden administration has set up the latest infrastructure influx of funds where there's real equity attached to it, which is critically important for communities that have oftentimes been left behind. Look, roads, bridges, critically important for obvious reasons. I got communities in Pennsylvania where they're still drinking water out of lead pipes. I don't have to explain to you how critically important that is. And that's particularly in black and brown communities that have oftentimes been ignored when it comes to infrastructure investment. I would say that the, the game changer on infrastructure investment really is high-speed affordable internet. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania is vast, 13 million people, 276,000 homes, businesses, VFWs, churches that lack connection to the internet about another 25,000 or so that have some connection, but it's just not fast enough to be able to do anything. It's gonna cost a little over a billion dollars to connect um, everybody to the internet. Good news is federal government's provided that money to Pennsylvania. We have a five-year plan to connect everyone to the internet. You're gonna see better health outcomes, education outcomes, economic outcomes, personal mental health outcomes, assuming you go to the right websites, with, um, with <laughs> folks having uh, access to the internet. That's gonna be a game changer, especially for rural communities in Pennsylvania that have just been you know, shut out for too long. Speaking of 
rural communities, one of the one of the rural communities have been hard hit by the opioid crisis over the years. Um, Pennsylvania, and I think that these are maybe 2020 numbers, but was among the states with the highest rates of mortality due to drug overdoses. Um, when you came into office, how did you scope that problem, um, and what's the state of it now, and what can be done? Because this is something that uh, all governors are wrestling with. Yeah. I've been working on the, the issue of the opioid crisis for a number of years. Prior to serving as governor, um, I was the Attorney General of Pennsylvania and, and led the nationwide lawsuit against the drug companies. We um, you know, reached into their greedy pockets, pulled out those ill-gotten gains, and brought it back to the states that they had ripped off and that, that they had poisoned with their addictive pills, knowingly sending those pills into our communities. Um, it, as a result of that legal work as Attorney General, it set Pennsylvania up, and other states as well, but Pennsylvania in particular, with nearly $2 billion available to combat the crisis. I get elected governor, now we've got the opportunity to actually invest it. So the first value statement here, and this is really critical, is I believe drug addiction is a disease, not a crime. And I think if you understand it that way, then what you do is you take those, in this case, $2 billion. I realize the numbers are sort of meaningless. Well, just let me throw in, is that $2 billion, isn't it over 18 years, though? It is over 18 years, front-loaded for the first four. Okay. So you can really get a lot of this going. Um, we are now in a position to invest to combat the crisis. And when you look at the crisis as a public health issue, when you look at it as a disease, not a crime, then naturally what comes from that is you're investing a lot more in treatment a lot more in services, a lot more in support for those going into treatment, transportation, childcare costs, you name it. And that is what we are trying to do right now in Pennsylvania. We are losing 14 Pennsylvanians every single day to addiction. And it's hitting our rural communities even harder. We have got to get on top of this, and the way we do that is, is by investing, investing more in treatment. You talked to about making sure that Pennsylvanians feel seen. How do you go, do you, and how do you, if you do, go into those communities where um, they might not have been your voter, yeah. uh, they might be suspicious of you? How, how do you build that bridge um, to make those connections? So look, I've, I've got a long history of showing up. I think first and foremost, you got to show up. And uh, I think, you know, for a long time, being candid, some folks in our party, uh, my party, stopped showing up and just started ignoring a lot of those communities. Uh, and I took a different approach. And look, I ran in 2016 for attorney general. Nobody knew me. I showed up in those communities. And on the same ballot where Secretary Clinton lost for president, um, I was third on the ballot. I won. In 2020, came back and outperformed everybody else on the ballot. Got more votes than anybody in the history of Pennsylvania. And then in 2022, ran for governor and got more votes than anybody ever got for governor. I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I'm saying that because I think the data bears out that showing up, listening to people, treating them with respect, John, something they oftentimes don't feel mm -hmm. from their elected leaders, and then, most importantly, delivering for them, delivering meaningful results for them. I think that's critically important. I... I also, I mean, even now as governor, I, I didn't just stop showing up. I still go to these communities, and I enjoy going to the communities now where they, we have a meeting, and I treat you with respect. You're the governor right now. But then they, the, the, those that look me in the eye after and go, you know, I didn't vote for you. Um, <laughs> first off, I appreciate their honesty because pretty much everybody says they voted for me. Somehow sure. I got, you know, 100 million yeah. votes in uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. But, yeah. but but no, I appreciate that yeah. because that, that shows a level of, of candor and willingness to engage. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what we need more of in our politics today, a willingness to engage from the citizenry to their elected officials and the elected officials to the citizenry. And I view that not as an up or down, but as a, a parallel conversation. You talk, that I think is a segue to getting us into the health and fragility of our democracy. President Biden is in Arizona today and he will say, there is something dangerous happening in America. Do you agree? And if so, what is the danger? I, 
I didn't know the president was in Arizona. I didn't know he was going to say that. I'm assuming the danger he's speaking of is relative to our democracy. He is. is right? It's a speech. This is the fourth, I believe, in a series of speeches in which he'll talk about the ongoing threat to democracy. I mean, look, I, it's hard for me to comment on his speech, but I, I will comment generally that um, I do believe our democracy is being tested. Um, you know, th throughout our nation's history, our democracy has been repeatedly tested. And if you look at each chapter in our American story, preserving, protecting our democracy, perfecting our union has fallen oftentimes to the hands not of the elected leaders, but the ordinary citizens who in moments of challenge, you know, rise up and, and seek justice. They, they demand more from their leaders. And I think over the last, you know, two or three decades, maybe we got a little complacent in that. We, we sort of lost perspective on that hard work that our ancestors did over many years. And then 2016 happened. And everything got turned on its head. And then, of course, January 6th made it visible for folks uh, to see in a way that maybe they hadn't seen before. To me, what has happened over the last number of years is a reminder um, of how critical citizen participation is and how critical the work we need to do is to perfect our union and defend our freedoms. I do believe that right now is another critical moment where we're going to be tested. The, Go ahead, no. I was just going to say, the former president has tried to erode our institutions and erode our democracy time and time again. Hell, he sued me 40 times. <laughs> 40 times, him and his enablers, in 2020 to first make it harder for people to vote, particularly people of color, and second, to try and throw away votes to try and thwart the will of the people. By the way, I went 40 and 0, and he went 0 and 40. We kicked his ass every single time. That, combined with what he did, stoking those on January 6th who went to try and thwart the will of the people and stop the vote from being counted, and the manner in which he is conducting himself in the run-up to this 2024 campaign suggests that he's not done with his work to try and erode our democracy. We have to keep at this. We have to keep battling. We have to get back to a place in this country where we all accept that we are bound by our commitment to our democracy, to our nation, to our freedoms, and then let's fight like hell over health care policy and foreign policy and taxes and everything else. But we are not even having the same conversation right now, and I think the president is right to sound the alarm on the effect that you know, the former president is having on, uh, on our democratic institutions. I've got a few more questions about the democratic process, but let me ask you about the courts as somebody yeah. who worked in it. There, there was generally a norm that you fight it out in court, you lose, well, the people, you know, have spoken. The jury has spoken yeah. or the judge has spoken, and the, the integrity of the law, you might not like it, you might grouse about it, but essentially had some fixity. The former president has attacked every judge that has ruled against him. His party has either um, embraced that in some instances, calling into question various rulings, the grand jury system, et cetera. What's your assessment of the health of those norms about trusting the legal system and the way it's set up, and how much has it eroded from whatever it was before we came into this current yeah. period? Look, I, and again, I'm a former attorney general of our Commonwealth. I, I do have faith in our system. I don't like every opinion that comes out, but I respect our, our courts, and our courts held in the last election. And so far, it seems like our justice system is it's slow, but it seems like it is doing its job to make sure that there is accountability for those who were there on January 6th and for those who, who stoked the fire on, on January 6th. I think that um, we need to, as Americans, not love every opinion that comes from a court, not love every decision that comes from a prosecutor, but we do need to make sure that those institutions are protected from the political winds of the day. You joined 23 other states in, in uh, instituting an automatic voter registration. The former president called you a radical left governor for doing this. <laughs> and, and Did he give me a nickname at least? Yeah. Or? <laughs> uh, 
and no. also that it was a totally unconstitutional act. Um, uh, He's a real legal genius. Three. <laughs> yeah. But see, a, a couple of things, seriously. Um, when he talks, uh, some of his supporters get activated. Um, when he said those things, did your, uh, was there any fibrillation in the universe with respect to other people um, reaching out in the ways that they do to your office? Um, it's a really obscure way to ask that yeah. question. <laughs> also, does anybody know what fibrillation means? Just so I know. Uh, no, look, uh, first off, first off, we are on sound legal footing, and the decision I made, as you correctly noted, is one that's been made in 23 other states, um, some led by Republican governors, some led by Democratic governors. Um, the, the idea that we're just gonna streamline a process for legal, eligible voters, and somehow that is bad, um, is remarkable to me. But to the heart of your question, yeah, I mean, there's still some people out there that when he says jump, they turn around and say, how high? That's pathetic. I mean, I, I, really, think, I really think that one of the stories that should be written is how profoundly and pathetically weak these followers of his are. And some of them occupy really serious positions, Mr. Speaker. I mean, it is crazy to me. It's crazy to me how he has this ability to control folks who otherwise are pretty reasonably intelligent people. And it's dangerous for our institutions. I can deal with anyone who has a different view than yeah. I do. I mean, I, I actually relish that when we have different views and we can really hash it out. And by the way, sometimes I'm wrong and we have to go with the other person's view or sometimes we find a, a middle ground. That's healthy, that's good. But where you're just malleable to the point where you're just willing to do whatever the hell the former president commands you to do on his goofy you know, Twitter adjacent you know, app or whatever, is, it's crazy to me. And, and it's dangerous for our institutions. I'm glad you found a heart to the question. Um, <laughs> but the reason I asked it so obscurely is I was actually talking about threats. You mean? I mean, does your security team say, uh, well, you know, you've been called a radical left governor, yeah. it's, it's totally unconstitutional? Because the heart of this question of democracy yeah. safety is if it's a constant message that everything's being done extra constitutionally, mm. if everything's being done around the the, the right way of doing things, then some people might feel, well, gosh, the system is so rigged, I must take things into my own hands to make things right again. And that we saw certainly on January, January 6th. January 6th, yeah. I mean, I think, I think we know the answer to that question, is that, that there are some people out there, certainly not a majority of sanction, but there are people out there who are willing to go be violent. Do you hear from them? Um, I, you know, look, I, I'm blessed to have a great group of people around me that, that keep me and my family safe. Uh, but I'm mindful that those, those folks are out there. And, and I think that's a danger in our society today. Swing state, important election coming up. Yep. What's the status of uh, the voting process? And there was a study released recently that said half, you talked about citizen engagement, mm -hmm. half of the poll workers uh, who participated in and maintained the structure of a healthy voting system which worked in 2020, half have dropped out which means some of them are not being replaced, and the ones that are replacing them are all new and fresh to the job, which creates more challenges. So what's the health of the voting system, and what are you doing to ensure it in Pennsylvania? Look, I, you know, John, my glass is maybe a little half fuller than the way your question was uh, framed. And you do know what I do for a living. I do. <laughs> I do. Um, I, would say, I would say that the storyline uh, from 2020 that sort of never gets written is that the reason why our institutions held were because of ordinary Republican and Democratic clerks in communities all across Pennsylvania who went and just did their jobs. They just did their jobs and they did it honorably and they counted the votes and if John got one more vote than Josh, John won and that's, that's the way it's supposed to work and so yeah, we've seen you know, some communities where it's a little harder to get a poll worker, where they don't want to put up with the abuse and the nonsense. But overall, in communities all across our Commonwealth, um, uh, we've had the level of citizen participation necessary to ensure that our elections have been free and fair 
and safe and secure. And in the time since 2020, guess what, John? Republicans have won and Democrats have won. The most important thing is the will of the people has been respected, and those clerks have carried out their duties um, really honorably. But in preparation for the next one, what uh, are you, are you, how much is this something that you need that, that concerns you? It concerns me. It concerned me when I was attorney general and I convened a, a, a group of both prosecutors as well as appellate attorneys who worked together to make sure that we had a free and fair, safe and secure election in 2020. And I'll be prepared to do it again as governor um, in 2024. The most important thing to me is that we have citizens engaged and participating in our democracy. I think more citizen participation equals a stronger democracy. That's why I made Pennsylvania an automatic voter registration state, and why I'm going to encourage people to get out and make their voices heard in 24. On, on that automatic registration, you say you were within your rights to do it. Yeah. Could you, would it have been smarter, in keeping with your um, notion of trying to reduce um, maybe the vitriol in our political system, to reach out to your Republican legislators and try to work with them on it, knowing how hot button this, this issue is? Look, there's certain things that I have the authority to do as governor, in this case, based on both federal and state law. Um, and what I did was not put forth something that's partisan. I don't care how you register. I don't know how you're registering. What I tried to do, just like I did with the corporate filings, just like I did on 95, just like I've done with our unemployment compensation system, I've tried to streamline the process and make it work better for folks. So now when you go to the DMV, you already have to prove you're a citizen and you have to give over the government documents and this and that to get your license. We're just creating a seamless process for you to also be registered to vote. And if you want to opt out, opt out. You want to register to be a Democrat, be a Democrat, Republican, Green, I'll, you register however you want. My job is to make it secure and streamlined, and that's what I did. Speaking of secure and streamlined, I have no idea how much I've gone over. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they haven't grabbed they haven't, us yet. They haven't. So I do feel as though I'm sinking further into yeah, this sure. chair. No. <laughs> uh, no, a couple more, a couple more hours, and you'll be down yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, you'll be down there with the quarters and the other I loose mean, change. I mean, uh, tell you what. Um, um, all right. Well, the, it, since nobody's come taking us away, let's keep going. Uh, Should we keep going? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're going to New Hampshire. Am I? I thought you were. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Maybe I should have ended the interview yeah. a few minutes ago. Let's see where this is going. Not to take anything away from New Hampshire. Yeah. People go to New Hampshire for all kinds yeah. of reasons. But politicians go to New Hampshire for one reason, and that's to say something larger. I'm not even going to get to your whatever your future ambitions are, but why are you going to New Hampshire? Look, um, <laughs> I was, first off, I'm really proud that um, the Democratic Party in New Hampshire invited me to keynote their convention on Saturday. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that they reached out, and I'm proud because, thank you. I think they see what's happening in Pennsylvania, where we are defending freedom, where we're getting stuff done, where we're showing that you can govern in a hyper-polarized world. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that we're going to now have an opportunity to both talk about the accomplishments we've made in Pennsylvania, campaign to make sure a Democrat gets elected governor of New Hampshire, campaign to make sure President Biden wins New Hampshire when he runs for re-election there, and hopefully, hopefully, have an impact on how we address these issues more broadly within our party and within our country. And so I'm excited for the opportunity to be able to do that. You're excited, uh, and not to bring back the word fibrillation again, but <laughs> many, fellow, no I mean. many fellow Democrats, uh, their heart is in a state of fibrillation because they're nervous about their, their, pres their party, their president's ability to win again. What will you tell nervous Democrats um, about the state of things? What Joe Biden's done for Pennsylvania. 276,000 homes and businesses are going to be connected to the internet because of the hard work he did to get an infrastructure law passed. In a divided world that we live in, he got that done. I'm going to talk about how we reopened I-95 in 12 days because the federal government partnered with us. I'm going to talk about um, how important it is to defend our freedoms in this country, the freedom for women to make decisions over their own body, the freedom for you to marry who you love, the freedom to be able to vote. All of that is on the ballot. And there are clear contrasts in this race between Joe Biden and presumably Donald Trump. And I think as folks 
focus on that clear contrast, the choice will be even clearer, and some of that fib fibble, mm -hmm. whatever you said, yeah. will go away. The Fibonacci sequence. The, yeah. yeah. Um, the Google right. that when I'm done. <laughs> All right, the 48th governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Here to explore the future of free speech and free expression, please welcome author Chimamande Ngozi Adichie. And leading the conversation is the Atlantic senior editor, Gal Beckerman. Well, I assume you're not clapping for me, so. <laughs> um, well, it is, uh, should we get you some water? I wasn't sure if it was fresh. Or... Oh, no, I don't think so. so. <laughs> um, well, it's great, to, uh, it's great to be here today with you, Chimamanda. Thank you, Gil, and um, you too. So we know that you're the author of three novels, including Americana, which is now basically part of the canon, <laughs> I think I can say. Uh, but in recent years, you've also become a pretty fierce uh, defender of the freedom of expression, um, especially in a moment uh, that feels particularly censorious in the United States, where there's been an uptick in book banning, there's publishers that feel sort of more reluctant to publish certain kinds of books. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> um, we'll also talk about uh, Mama's uh, sleeping scarf. I'll ask you some very hard-hitting questions eventually, <laughs> um, but uh, but we'll get to that in, in a bit. Um, so recently, I rewatched your 2009 TED Talk, the one that went viral, "The Danger of a Single Story," in which you describe the way that uh, that people can sort of limit one another by placing very constricting narratives about who they are. The story you told about coming to the United States as a Nigerian, people had very fixed ideas about what it meant to be from Africa. And, um, so I, I wanted to ask you about sort of the state of the single story right now, and with a slight twist, which is this, which is when I watched that you know, TED talk, it seemed to me you were talking about how other people impose a single story on one another. But I also see that we're in a moment where people are imposing single stories on themselves, you know, whether it be race or gender or political affiliation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, about all, of, of all of that. Wow. That was long. I don't start, I don't start <laughs> with the easy ones. <laughs> all right. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for um, the welcome. It was for both of us, girl, not just for oh, OK, OK. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> yes. <okay. laughs> um, no, I think you know, it's interesting what you said about the single story not, no longer being just about an outside imposition but also almost in some ways a self in mm -hmm. position. And you know, the idea that I'm seen as a fierce defender of, of, of the freedom to express oneself is not really, I don't want to be that, right. but it feels important to talk about because mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's a problem with the way that we're living now, which is, um, so the w one thing is I think we now kind of live in these tribes, mm. so the, the sort of ideological tribes. And these ideological tribes, I think, have imposed on us a kind of, um, the, a kind of, what we're supposed to, the, an adherence to orthodoxy. Mm. Right? So this, um, Ayad Akhtar, who's a writer I really admire, he, he calls it, he says that there's a moral stridency mm. in the way that we respond to speech and that there's something punitive about it. And I think it's true. I think people are afraid. Hmm. And because people are afraid, people self-censor. They don't say. So the, the single story, they then impose it on themselves. Um, I think it happens with publishing. I think it happens in politics. You have people who now increasingly think that you cannot write about experiences that you have not personally had. Hmm. And I think that's terrible for literature and for the idea of an imagination that is allowed to grow and soar. And mm. you know, I don't think that there's any human um, endeavor that requires freedom as much as creativity does. Mm. 
I mean, how can we write novels if in our heads we've imposed a single story for ourselves, if we self-censor, if we're thinking, I can't go there, I can't go there, I can't be honest, I can't really say what I think. Right. You know, um, and so I just worry. I worry that that um, that that what we're looking at is the end of curiosity, mm -hmm. the end of creativity, the end of learning. Even, right? I'm sure if I ask people in this audience um, if there, there's anyone here who has questions they want to ask about certain things, but they don't because they're afraid mm -hmm. of either being misunderstood or asking it the wrong way or getting some kind of you know, um, pushback or, or, I think if people were honest, I think there would be quite a few of them here. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes even saying that I'm afraid to ask in itself right. comes with po the possibility of backlash so we don't right. say. Now do you, when you gave that TED talk in mm. 2009, which is now a while ago, did you have that aspect of the single story in mind or was it more that you felt that the, the certain ways that society was sort of conceiving mm. of you were limiting? Yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't. I mean, and I think at the time, I don't think that what I imagined to be this sort of broad social phenomenon, it wasn't really happening then, mm. right? I think America has always, of course, had these ideological extremes, but I don't think it, it at the time, it, it was as present mm -hmm. as it is now. What prompted that really was two things, coming to the US to go to college and just being shocked by how little people knew of my world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just thought that it was very strange that in um, 1997, people would ask me, do you have houses in Nigeria? <laughs> right? And I just, I was, I was stunned by that, you know. And in some ways, when you're outside of the US and America has such cultural power right, that right. we're all familiar in some ways with right. America. So we watch the films, we listen to the music. And in some ways, you stupidly assume that mm. America also has a sense of you. Right. And then I came here and I just was shocked by that. Yeah. But it also made me think about how, in some ways, we're all, as human beings, um, potentially guilty of having mm -hmm. a single story about other people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so while I was upset that they knew very little about where I had come from, um, I went to Mexico and I realized, my goodness, I'm doing the same thing right. that Americans right. did to me. Because in Mexico, I thought, my God, they're normal, they're happy, they're laughing. <laughs> because I had been in this country where the constant coverage of Mexicans right. was so negative and so one-sided right. Right. that I go to Mexico and I'm shocked. Right. And so I just felt I wanted to talk about that, that, that very human, I think, mm -hmm. um, human thing that we all have, mm -hmm. but also how important it is maybe to be a bit more self-aware. Mm. But I did not at all foresee <laughs> what's happening now. Right. This right. kind of just, just what I think is just a really horrible um, social censure that's mm. connected to the ability to speak and express right. oneself. Right. Mm -hmm. You, you recently wrote an essay about on the 10-year anniversary of the publication of Americana, mm. and uh, we published it in the, in the Atlantic as well, and you had a lot of interesting things in there about sort of what the genesis was of the book, yeah. including what you're talking about right now. Yeah. There was one line and one particular word that stood out to me that I just wanted to read you. Uh, you said, of all of the complicated emotions that animated the conception of this novel, bewilderment was the most <laughs> present. And so I wanted to, to ask you, what, what bewilders you? And I think you were referring to sort of your sense of bewilderment at the thing that you just described, which yes. is the, the limited understanding of you, yes. your place in the world. Yes. Um, what bewilders you today about America? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know that we have enough time, though, but I'm going to try. <laughs> I thought you might say that. <laughs> So, well, first of all, politically, I, I genuinely do not understand, and I think it's a worthy question to ask, the appeal of Donald Trump. Um, I, I just do not understand it. And I think, you know, the, we're talking about, oh, who's going to win um, the elections in this country? And, and it seems to me that there is a kind of almost willful um, disregard of the fact that there's a person who I think is dangerous for this country, who has enormous support in certain mm. parts of this country. And we should ask, I think we should ask why. why? Yeah, I want to understand it and I don't. So that bewilders me. Um, I think also this idea of, you know, the, the tribal um, orthodoxies, you know, that there's certain things you're not supposed to say. I think in this country now, if somebody on the right agrees with something, 
there are many people on the left who feel compelled to immediately disagree with right, it right. and not think about the content of it. Right, right. So this kind of tribal thinking, mm -hmm. um, which I think shuts down thought. Mm. You know, we're not thinking critically. Mm -hmm. So someone on the right approves of this, I don't approve of it because I'm on the left. And I think also the reverse is the case. Yeah. And I find that bewildering on so many levels because it, what it means is that we can't even talk about you know, I want to talk about the content of things. I want to be able to, um, you know, decide for myself whether mm -hmm. something is good or bad and, and not have it be linked to whether my tribe right. approves of it. Right. And I think it's getting worse and worse. And so, which is the reason why I'm increasingly bored with political discourse in this country, mm. because I can see someone on TV or read a piece in a newspaper and I kind of know what their position is mm -hmm. on anything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and often it's very tribally correct, yeah. which may not necessarily be <laughs> intellectually correct. Right. <laughs> you know? right. right. So that bewilders me. Um, but this is also a country, you know, this is, America is my second home. I, and there's a kind of, you know, in the way that you worry when you see something you care about starting to crumble, mm. that's the feeling I have about mm. the US mm. right now. Social media, which I know, oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm just gonna <laughs> throw the happy subjects at you. Um, I know that this sort of provokes some sadness in you. We, we talked about it a little bit uh, backstage um, because of the way that it's created yeah. a kind of conformity or, yeah. you know, f especially with young people sort of not able to break out of certain yeah. orthodoxies. I wanted to read sort of a long, a longish thing that you said in, tw in tw you wrote in 2021, in which you did not mince words about <laughs> how you felt. You said, we have a generation of young people on social media so terrified of having the wrong opinions that they have robbed themselves of the opportunity to think and to learn and to grow. I've spoken to young people who tell me they are terrified to tweet anything, to, to your point just now, that they read and reread their tweets because they fear they will be attacked by their own. The assumption of good faith is dead. What matters is not goodness, but the appearance of goodness. We are no longer human beings. We are now angels jostling to out-angel one another. God help us, it is obscene. Um, so I guess I'm curious to hear specifically about the effect that you think this might have on creativity. Yeah. And you, you do work with, with younger writers. I know yeah. that you have this wonderful workshop uh, in Nigeria that you said hasn't happened since 2019, but you have this experience yeah. of working with, with younger writers. Um, what, what do you see as sort of the greater impact on creativity from the dynamic that you're describing here? Oh, goodness. Well, first of all, really listening, I thought, ah, oh, that's not bad. I, mean, I, you know, I don't know what <laughs> that's to That's a good thought, feeling. Oh, that's kind of okay. <laughs> I'd forgotten that I wrote that. Yeah. But, you know, I think, well, first of all, I think that there is, it seems to me that there is a decline today, a massive decline in compassion. Mm and also a decline in moral courage. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways both are connected, mm. um, which is, you know, the young people, and not just young people, really, everyone, people who are in, on social media, there's an expectation that you will not get compassion. And so, you know, you, you tweet something and then people are coming at you, even your friends who know that you, who, and, and that, that idea that whatever you say has the most uncharitable, mm -hmm. um, that people will read it in the most uncharitable way. Mm. I think it makes people hold back. Mm. And then, of course, the moral courage part of it is that there are people who could speak up and they don't. Yeah. I think what's happening now in the sort of, you know, the books that are not being published, the, you know, you open the newspapers and often there's someone who's been dropped from something. It's often not because those in positions of authority really believe that what has been said was bad, it's because mm. they're afraid. Mm. They're afraid of themselves being attacked. And that's what I mean by moral courage, that mix of compassion and moral courage. Yeah. And what it does for people who, who are creative is it makes you, um, it makes you turn in wards. Yeah. You know, you're no longer willing to, I think creativity also requires a kind of risk taking. Mm. You know, you have to be able to, um, to go outside of what is comfortable for you. I think that's where great art comes from. Right. And so with this, kind of, with this kind of social censure hanging over people, it's so much more difficult, I think, right. Right. to create, to write. Right. And, and I see that, and I haven't done the workshop in, um, since COVID, and I'm doing it this year, but you can see that even in the, in the small space of a workshop, I constantly have to say to people, it's okay. 
right? You can actually, if you can actually write that, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay because you can see that they're already worried about what the people in the workshop are going to think. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a, I remember this young man who wrote a story about a man who um, is objective, who sees a young woman and he just completely objectifies her. So he writes the story and he reads a bit of it and then the other people in the workshop just come for him. Mm. And they're like, oh my God, you're sexist, you're misogynist. And then this poor guy says, no, I don't agree with the character. I don't agree with the character. And you know, it just made me think we can't even read anymore. Yeah. I mean, this idea that we immediately, the assumption is somehow that he is condoning mm. what the character does. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a problem, right? right. It's, and it's the same way that we, um, again, I think it's, it's a lack of compassion, but also in some ways that we can't even read anymore. <laughs> I mean, that, right. that I, I don't know, I wish people would read more and particularly read more imaginative writing. Right. I think it right. would make, Right. Maybe it would make us a bit more right. compassionate. No, I wanted to ask you, because this critique that I know that you have, you know, of what we're describing here, this mm -hmm. sort of like adherence to a kind of orthodoxy, a scare, a fear of sort of stepping out of line. It's something that we see a lot on the progressive yeah. left. Yeah. And how does it, and since you have sort of made this point a few times mm -hmm. publicly, um, how does it feel to be the one who kind of is at risk of looking like a scold to your own <laughs> to your own side, so to speak. <laughs> oh, that doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother you. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it, it's. I wish I didn't have to. I mean, I really want to just stay home and, and read poetry yeah. and try and write fiction. <laughs> Honestly, that's really what I want to do. Yeah. But but I've always been that. You know, even as a child, I was sort of the one who felt compelled to speak out about things I thought were unjust. You know, that kind of nonsense because right. I I want to save the world, all of that. But but again, it's coming from a place of of love. Right. I'm, so in terms of tribes, I am on the left. You know, right. I, I, think that, I think that the political left makes more sense and mm -hmm. is more humane in general. But I also think that there's so many problems now with the left. So we can talk about the right and the kind of crazy book banning, the yeah. book banning well, I was that are happening. Because your own book was, was, Apparently, was banned. Uh, yeah, and I don't know why. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I thought, I mean, such a ghost company, though. I mean, look at all the wonderful books that yeah. have been banned. But, <laughs> But that, that's just really bad because you're, you're depriving children mm -hmm. of, of knowledge and of, of pleasure, yeah. because books bring yeah. pleasure. And you know, on the right as well, all of this talk about, which I find just personally abhorrent, this decision to hide the mm -hmm. truth of history. Mm -hmm. And so in the name of stupid ideas like CRT, they're not allowing children know the history of America. Mm. You know, I think that African American history is essential. It is American history. And the truth has to be told. And somehow this idea that you want to protect children from not feeling bad yeah. about the truth is absurd, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I, was also, <laughs> I was also thinking about you know, often on the right, you hear when they want to uh, make fun of people on the left, they say, well, facts don't care about your feelings. Yeah. Actually, we should be saying that to people on the right who want to, who want to um, hide the truth of African-American history. Right. You know? and, and I came, obviously, from, from Nigeria to go to college, and I didn't really know very much about African-American history. And I, mm -hmm. and I, because I was curious and I wanted to understand, started reading African-American mm -hmm. history. Um, I feel that I'm a bit of an expert now, self-styled. Self but, but for me, really, it was a story of such wonderful grace and grit, right. not just about, you know, the horrors. And I think young Americans should know that. You know, they should know that. They deserve to. But on the left, it bothers me that my own tribe, um, you know, it's easy for us to criticize people who are banning books. But what are we saying to ourselves about the self-censorship that we are promoting right. and about the way that we attack our own so viciously? Mm -hmm. right? we, we, there's a sense in which on the left, it's so easy to fall short of expectations. It's so easy. You know, there's a kind of, I mean, what I said about out-angeling um, one another, we're now supposed to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that kind of puritanism. You're, you're not even supposed to, you're supposed to know everything, right? Um, you're supposed to know the right language to use. You're mm -hmm. supposed to know, and you're not, you're not expected to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And if you do ask, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you this about when I was in, um, I was speaking to some students and I won't tell you where, but you know, we're talking about things and suddenly I stop and I ask them, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, these, there's, there's this ascendancy of buzzwords 
we throw things around. And so I said to them, explain it to me as if I were in kindergarten. Mm. And they couldn't. Mm. There's a kind of, so we, we, we throw these things out and we expect everyone to know them. But yeah, I mean, I, I think on the left, and again, of course I care more about the left because it's, you know, it's kind of where I feel more comfortable. And it's not that I'm being a scold. I'm hoping that what I'm doing is saying what a lot of people on the left are thinking. I see. Yeah? I see. But also, I hope that what I'm doing is, is that maybe I'm able to get a few people to stop and say, wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. But I think if more of us decided that we were going to, for example, um, be less vicious, mm -hmm. a bit more compassionate, mm -hmm. you know, just give people a bit more room. Right. Um, maybe, maybe be more charitable. When somebody says something, don't immediately... So don't immediately interpret it to mean the worst possible thing. Mm -hmm. if, we, if more of us did that, maybe the tone on social media would change a bit. Maybe the literature will, we produce would be a bit more, um, would be a bit less narrow. You know, I don't really find contemporary fiction very interesting yeah, I was going to ask you about that. We, 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 well, we can, like, let's, let's take yeah. that up. So <laughs> you were telling me backstage that you don't, you don't read much or you don't, I, I imagine yeah. you still read I read, I mean, I try to, I really try to keep, so, you know, I'm, I'm constantly buying books and I do try to, and I, I do that because I'm thinking about when I started and how terrified I was that nobody would buy my books. Yeah. So I'm always trying to buy, especially first novels, you know, I just go, and I buy them and I, and I almost never finish them. But is there a consist, is, <laughs> no, it's true. Is there, is there, is there some sort of consistent thing that you're saying, oh, here we go again, you know, like, or, or, yes. or something that there, you're bumping up against as a reader? I remember recently reading this book and I thought, my God, everybody is good mm. in this book. And that's a lie. I mean, you, you, you know, but, no, but it's true. The thing about being human, and this is what literature should do for us. It should show us all sides of ourselves. Right, right. And I read this book and everyone was good and everyone was ideologically correct. Mm. Everyone had all the right opinions. Right. And I thought, that I think we call that propaganda, no? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not literature. You know, it's, it's and, and, and you can see that the people are not real people. I mean, I, I love this expression, um, um, H.G. Wells, that, that literature should be about the jolly coarseness of life. Mm. And to that, I like to say, it doesn't have to be jolly. Just right. the coarseness of right. life will right. do. Right. And I find that in a lot of these um, contemporary books, even when they dare to approach something that might be even remotely controversial, mm. It's very, um, it's, it's very half-hearted. It's just, it doesn't feel real. And you can tell that the writer is so aware of the possibility of backlash. Right. I mean, we live in a world now where people talk about sensitivity readers. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you were a writer, you don't want your publisher to have to get a sensitivity reader for your book. Right. So you're going to do the sensitivity right. writing yourself. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the other sort of, to me, victims of some of this sens censoring sort of attitude is humor, you know, mm. because um, just mm. the ability to, and, and you know, humor you need to, mm. in order to, you want to be able to roam imaginatively yes. into other people's minds and, and, uh, and that makes for good writing. And yes. uh, as I was thinking about talking to you today, I remembered one of my sort of highlights of when I was an editor at the New York Times Book Review was uh, in 2016, you wrote a short story for us uh, in, which, <laughs> in which you entered the mind of Melania Trump and, 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 and wrote a story from her perspective. So I first, had to I first had to make sure this wasn't like a fever dream that I had. So I, I went, but I went back and I read, I read the story, which was quite charming and good. I should say this was before the election. Yes. So that's an important piece of context here. But I could also tell how much fun you were having sort of trying to get into her head, and it was funny. And, and um, so I don't know. I, oh, I'm, good I'm Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. You're really bringing up things that I would rather put away. <laughs> no, that's, that's, no, tell me what you're curious about, though. No, I was, yeah. I was curious about sort of the, because that seemed very much coming from a place of, of humor, of wanting to sort of play around <laughs> with an idea. And, and it was humor that had the effect of some empathy. Yes. You, were, you, you actually sort of tried to get into her head, tried to really understand her. I did. Her. And I did a lot of research. I mean, I went and I read about this woman, about her family, and uh -huh. you know, I, I read about you know, the little town where she came from. And, and I, I have to say that at the time, I felt much sympathy for her because mm. I thought, 
this is not what she signed up for, right. what I was thinking. I do have to say, to be very honest, because I, I, you know, I believe in being truthful, that my views about her, my sympathy has, has um, you know, sort of decreased substantially. <laughs> um, and that decrease started when I learned about her, her um, belief in this ridiculous idea of, of Obama not being born in America. Mm. And um, that just really annoyed me, because yeah. I thought, really, you? I mean, seriously? Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that empathy decreased, I'm sorry to say. But okay. I did try you know, to, to make her human, and, and also, yes, to laugh about it. But, but also, I think that humor as a, as a, as a device in storytelling mm. Is so important because right. because we can use humor to talk about things that really matter, mm -hmm. and humor is universal. And so when people are laughing, but they're also sort of taking something in. Mm -hmm. And here's the other thing about the pro the progressive left, um, my tribe, we've lost the ability to laugh. Well, that's that's what it seems to me yeah. is, is really one have. of the biggest uh, yeah. victims of all yeah. this. Yeah, and yeah. it's a shame. Yeah. I mean, there's sort of now this you know we all sort of wake up in the morning and we put on our cloaks of sanctimony and we go off to you know. <laughs> Well, you, may, you, may, you may not have you may not have felt you know somebody might not have felt able to write inside Melania Trump's head for fear of looking like they were yes. sympathizing with with her. Yes, right? yeah. yes. Yeah. But the role of a storyteller is to imagine what a human being is thinking and feeling. Right. You know, we we and I think storytellers are essential for for every society. If we don't have our story, storytellers feeling free enough to tell mm -hmm. our stories. We're losing something, and then the generations who will come after us, I right. think they're going to just be startled. Right. You know, we look back and we read, we read Dickens, and we, you know, I read Balzac, and I'm, I'm, I get a sense of what life was like then. I worry that, I wonder if people reading contemporary writing mm. today will get a true sense of what our lives are like. Right, right. And so I'm going to, no, I, and I'll tell you this without naming names, but um, should I? I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I wrote this children's book, yeah. my first children's book, and I was, um, I was going to do, I had been you know, asked to do an interview with a very respected uh, media outfit in America. And um, a few days before the interview, my, um, my publisher tells me, oh, I'm so sorry, they just said you can't, they cannot go forward with the interview. Mm. And I said, oh. Why? And they said, well, because they think that they cannot interview you if you're not willing to address the comments you made in 2017 about trans women. Trans women yeah. And I was so stunned by that. Mm. I thought, well, I wrote a children's book. Yeah. And I think what stunned me even more was the willingness of this media organization to be open about the reason that they were canceling the interview. Right. I mean, usually people, if people felt that there was something maybe not so... Um, admirable about their reasons, they would kind of hide them, right? Mm -hmm. They might say, oh, the producer is unwell. Mm -hmm. But they said that, and it made me think, I mean, I, you know, I was stunned, and I have to say I was kind of hurt. Mm -hmm. But also it made me start to understand how certain people can um, choose not to speak out. And by this I mean, in the past I would sometimes say, look, you know, there's some people who are so successful. You know, can you just say these things publicly? There are people who would write to me and say, you know, I really agree, there's so much censorship, but they will not say it publicly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I will think a little bit judgmentally, I'd be like, well, you're very successful, why don't you say it publicly? But when this happened, my first thought was, oh, this book that I love mm. will not get to find readers. Right. And so it made me start to understand that human impulse, it's not that we, it's not even about wanting money, or it's, it's that you've created something that you really want the wall to see. Right. And the possibility that you might be denied that makes you hold back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and so to to and since I've already so in I gave I did an interview in 2017 in which I was asked, and it was in London, um, and I said I think a trans woman is a trans woman. And I think that because I think it's so important for us to make distinctions. Because I, as a person who was born with a body designed to create a certain size of gametes, that has completely shaped my life. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, before I was, I was born, my father's family said to my mother, we hope it's a boy. Mm -hmm. And um, to which my mother said, well, you know, I, I'll have whatever I have, sort of thing. My mother was wonderful. 
But, but you know, this idea that, you know, I, I grew up in a culture in which because I'm a woman, I cannot inherit property, all of those things. So it's shaped so much of my life. And I said that not at all thinking that I was right. causing offense at all. Right. Not intending to cause offense. But I also understand that it's possible to cause offense without meaning to, right? Yeah. It, it is. Um, but, but, you know, I, I didn't. And so afterwards, I was so taken aback mm. by, you know, there were... You know, people wrote to people. I mean, it was just really horrible. I took mm. to my bed for two weeks. Mm. But what, and I, I don't like to talk about it because I don't like to cast myself as a victim. There's a kind of, there's almost, it's almost impossible to talk about this with nuance without being accused either of, oh, you're making yourself the victim or, oh, you're so insensitive kind of thing. Well, that's part of the problem, right? That is I mean. part of the problem. <laughs> and that in some ways maybe is why I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I, I want to make a case for more nuance, right? right? and also a case for maybe more holistic thinking, because I, I remember thinking, but well, why would anybody think that I meant harm? Because people said, well, you're creating a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, people said you're a murderer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I sort of, my whole life has been about the celebration and the embrace of diversity and sort of, right. you know, I love the idea that we are different in the world. And, and I think my walk speaks for myself, you know, for itself and, and the, the things, positions I've taken. And so it made me start to realize how, again, that idea of compassion, that idea of a kind of narrowing, a very, mm. very vicious narrowing mm. of um, just how one is supposed to be, right? right? right. And, and I also, you know, I got a lot of flowers from people during that period. It was almost as though somebody had died. No, seriously. Um, flowers sympathy, from... Sympathy, sympathy. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, just think about it. And, and, you know, and at the time, my parents were still alive, and my father did not understand. Mm. And, you know, my father was born in 1932. He was a professor of, of, of statistics. He reads very widely. Um, we often disagree. My father, um, you know, my father, I think, thought I was maybe too lefty. Mm -hmm. And so to him, it was just puzzling. Right. You know, he's like, I, but what, what, why? And I found that it was difficult for me to explain it to him. Right. And it also made me start to think about, you know, the assumptions that we make. I mean, I, only in having that conversation with my father did I start to realize that even I had assumptions about, well, surely you should know this. Right, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I've, um, I think I've blathered on for long yeah. enough. Um, we, all, we have very little time left, but I, um, I mean, in fact, probably no time. But I, I do want to ask you about this um, because, you know, I'm curious what the, the kind of joys and challenges of writing in this form were. Was it harder than embodying Melania Trump or, or, or easier? It um, was uh, easier. Easier. Okay. <laughs> no, I wrote it. It's actually based on, on, on the day in the life of my daughter. Oh. We, um, and I wanted to, I just really wanted to celebrate the ordinary. I think there's just that idea of just an ordinary day and you're spending time with your family and there's just something very beautiful about it. Yeah. And my daughter, who is now going, who's going to be eight in two weeks, she, um, and I remember I'm, I'm carrying her one day and she pulls off my scarf because I always you know, tie a scarf to sleep as, as most black women I know have something on their heads when they sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's also what, what I want. I wanted to celebrate the ordinariness of black right. life. You know, I think there are a number of people who do not know that. Yeah. Um, and I thought, yes, I shall now spread the gospel of <laughs> black women's um, headgear for yeah. sleep. Yeah. But, but it was also really just, you know, my daughter pulled it off. And I, and I, I had one of those, I just felt so moved. I mm. thought, this moment will pass. She'll, she, she won't remember it. I probably will forget it. And I don't know, I just felt this sort of, you know, I'm, I'm giving to fits of strange melancholy and nostalgia. nostalgia yeah. So I had one of those fits and I started making notes. And I, and I also wanted to celebrate my parents. Yeah. I was very close to my parents. Yeah, and, and the pseudonym is, is, yes. is your parents. So, yeah. yeah. It's funny because I, when I read the book, I, I, I was having my own nostalgia of not having kids anymore who are the age. Yes to read yes. this type of picture yeah. book and sort of missing that. Okay, the last question, I have to ask this because the fans out there you know, are going to want to know. It's the question that every author hates to get, but you know, it's been 10 years since Americana. <laughs> cool, that's a like, terrible <laughs> framing. <laughs> uh, uh, can, we, can we expect another novel at some point? No, 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 no. <laughs>
Okay. No, I'm, I'm walking on and off. Yes. I'm trying, I'm trying to, um, well, you write books, so you know what that feeling is. I know, I know. Like, and I know so. what a terrible question that is to and ask. And especially when you frame it as, well, it's been 10 years. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so immediately I go into a panic. My God, it's been 10 years. I am walking on a novel. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm walking on a novel. And okay. I'm, yeah, hoping. That's all we need to know, is that it's coming. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome back The Atlantic's Candice Montgomery. Thank you to all our speakers for joining us. This concludes our Idea Stage programming for today, but there's still more programming across the Atlantic Festival. One of today's speakers, Shimamanda Ngozi Adichie, will be signing copies of her books out in the lobby on your way out. I hope you'll take a few moments to check the My Agenda page for details about this afternoon's programming, including Women of Washington at Pearl Street at 3.30 p.m. For our 21 and older guests, happy hours on the District Pier at 5 p.m., hosted by CBS News. Now enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.